All right, hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 4th, 2024. Oh, man, we're going to have another fun one tonight, another exciting one, another jaw-dropping one. And it, it, it's kind of the, the first part is going to continue to tie in to these last two, the revelation that was here that led us to the revelation in this one. And then I'm going to continue into the, the this timing to see if we can maybe understand a little more clearly this otherworldly timing of things that are coming. I wanted to see what we can understand in these potential times. I think one, well, two portions are extremely clear. But we're going to dig into it. We're going to see how clear it is, what somebody else is saying about it who's studied these things for decades, and uh, just see how it goes from there. But in the first part, it's pretty wild. We're going to build a little bit more, especially on the last teaching, and it has to do with the placement of a word. The placement of this word that's used twice in the same context, in the same description, whereas the other times, it means always the same thing. Now, it means the same thing as you'll see in the other two ways it says it, but where it says it and why it changes the word, even though it's a simple meaning word, I think leads us to even more clues and realization of this season and time that we are looking at and you know <laughs> i know for many of you it's it's weighty right now right like it's it's it, it's heavy and you can imagine i don't know if any of you imagine what it's like for me uh but it feels like i'm like there's a thousand pounds just sitting on my mind all the time and it it really keeps it has me quiet during the day it just has me you know i need to take breaks and like i've said before and just go grab a coffee outside and do something because i'm just always in my thoughts and in thoughts and in prayers with the lord and and thinking about all these things and contemplating and it just gets to be a lot so what really excites me as you guys know is doing these teachings and when i speak with me, with a, a number of you and i was speaking with our brother roy today a little later this afternoon and uh you know it just it fired me up even more when when we realize these things that have come together at this time we were looking for a year's end. We got the year's end. We were looking for a count in a, in a Hebrew calendar, which gives us the year's end. We were looking for this, this count that begins in Taurus, and it had to equal a connection to the timing of Jesus' birth, but two months after his birth, according from Isaiah 9 to Matthew chapter 4, that would reveal the timing of when he would come to begin his 40 days as the white horse rider. It, it ends up also falling on a Gregorian calendar date, not we're not talking about the pre-trib here, but on the eighth day when he comes as the Son of Man, connected to Halloween, this day of 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 dressing up and deceiving and, and going up to people's doors and all of these things. And all of this. And and what was, what is significant historically about October 31st? Why is there a deception that's been twisted into it? Because of the significance of it, all of these things equal later this month. Every part and piece of these things are connected. And let's not forget the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has been a big deal for us. The Gospel of John has what we call chapters to years. The 21 chapters play out over the big picture 21 years of which the seven are easy then you've got the 14 years which is a picture also of the story of genesis the first 21 chapters we've broken these things down and here we are at a point where it now also goes from chapter seven from the great eighth day and boom the story begins everything in its place that we have understood including the Lord coming as Psalms 19 in the chapters to years connected to that and what comes before in Psalms 18 with a devastation and shaking coming first. All of these parts, all of these pieces, for those that have been around for a while, 
they're all pointing to this time. And what else are we looking for? We're looking for the end of 70 years. This is why we've been so adamant in this fall since August. And the things that we looked for in August are the exact same things applied in October based on a calendar beginning in Taurus as the Holy Spirit revealed four and a half years ago. All of it culminating from the 24th, 25th to October 31st to the November 1st. And it is significantly historically connected and important as well. And it will even equal, according to the revelation, according to history, will equal what it will be like at about mid-tribulation as well, at the end of the sixth year of seals. It is absolutely wild. And we're going to touch on these things. We're going to go into some of these things again to build on these last couple things, especially the last one. So hold on tight. And for anybody that's new, <laughs> you're already hearing things that's making you say, what, 21 year big picture and then 14 years? And what's he talking about? Well, that's what you're going to come to understand here in this ministry. We've been revealed the revelation of what we call the open books, the, the mystery of prophecy that had been sealed in the books till the time of the end. To understand it, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. When you're there, you can click on the intro series, or you can come to the playlist right here. And on this playlist, click on this one right here, Intro to the End Times Revealed, and it's the Revealed End Times Study Note series. There's 12 videos on it. We only ask that you start with the first four. Take your time on them. The first one is only 22 minutes, and it gives you uh, an overview of the next three. The second one is a 30-minute Bible study that reveals to you the mystery of the Gospels. We call it who the Gospels are speaking to. Have you ever studied the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and said, why is the same story sound different in all three sometimes? Why is the story only in Matthew and only in Luke and sometimes not in Mark? And the story in Matthew and Luke, it's supposed to be the same story, but even it's spoken of differently. We've been told all of our lives that these things are just perspective. And in the is of things that took place, it is perspective. But there's a reason for them and a reason we have three synoptic gospels and not just one gospel that just lays out the whole story. It is called the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to. And all of the differences within the gospels are all prophetic. Every single one of them. And we have proven out dozens and dozens and dozens of them over the past seven years. You'll hear things, like I just said, the is of what we're living in. So what you understand is the was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And the is to come is from the moment of the pre-trib until the end. Was, is, and is to come. It's always in threes. And what you're going to see in the revelation of these gospels and what they reveal, you're going to see Matthew, Mark, Luke. The last will be first. The first will be last. It go, In the end of days, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. You're going to see crazy things in that 30-minute Bible study of the second video to help you begin to understand these things. You're going to see crazy things like when Jesus was going to the cross in Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which the Strong's Concordance tells us is radiant, white, beautiful, like a bridal gown, right? And in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. Purple and scarlet are both tribulation colors like the woman riding the beast. Because Mark and Matthew's portions are seals and trumpets. They're there for the end of days. And when you see all the little pieces, right now you might say, oh, this guy's crazy. I promise you, there's no way I could have been doing this for seven years, showing it in dozens and dozens and all throughout from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation and thousands of people following if it wasn't true and everybody seeing it for themselves. Take the time in this, in this intro series and I promise you it will blow your mind. It is the open books, the mystery that was hidden in the word for the revelation of the open books at the end of days. The third video is where you're going to see it's another 30-minute intro <clears throat> to detail to you the, the true timing of the end of days. You're going to see Luke's represents a period of time called above, which is a 50-day period. Mark's is the revelation of seven years of seals, 
and Matthews is the seven years of trumpets. There are 14 years. And you're going to say this sounds even crazier than the Gospels. Well, I promise you, when you see all the places it shows it, you will begin to understand for yourself. And then the big question is, how did we not know this before? How was this not seen? One, the number one answer is because it wasn't yet time for these things to be revealed. But it has been over the past seven years. And what you're going to see is in that fourth video, it's a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. And it breaks down why these things were missed and how these were not understood yet. And it's because we have all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. All of our lives, we've been taught for hundreds of years from the Gospel of Matthew. And they would go to Mark to pull out a little bit to fill in blanks in Matthew. And they'd go even less to Luke and fill in the blanks that they found that they would have in Matthew. And they would take a little bit from Luke, even less than Mark. When you realize that everything we've been taught gives us a foundation in the Gospel of Matthew, it's the reason everything you see is only seven. Once you realize who the Gospels are speaking to, you will fully comprehend why the first seven was missed. And that is Mark's portion. It's to the whole world in Mark's portion. You're going to see Matthew is written to the Jews, is written to the house of Judah. But what they've missed is that the house of Israel, which is the world where the ten tribes have scattered throughout the earth and are mixed in, and they are now the church, that is who Luke, uh, Mark is written to. That's the group that, that say they believe in Christ, but most of them are kind of stuck in the world and don't spend time with them really, aren't diligently seeking him. Those are the ones that will endure seals, but will be in the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And Luke's is the pre-trib bride of Christ, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, seeking and searching him, watching and praying, loving, repentant. Those are his bride. And what do you realize? Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew is post. There is a taking to the third heaven, there is a taking to paradise, and there's a return to, from the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Pre, mid, and post are all true. And the revelation comes clear in the understanding of Luke, Mark, and Matthew and who the Gospels are speaking to and revealing the above with seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. You will begin to understand all of that in this intro series that you can watch here on the playlist on YouTube or go to ministryrevealed.com. Another thing you'll hear me talk about sometimes is the forum. We have 12, 1,300 people in there from around the world. People are posting, you know, prayer requests and news and events. Of course, it's going crazy with everything with Israel right now. We are watching that like hawks because we know, we have an understanding of what's about to take place. And before a certain thing takes place, the pre-trib bride of Christ is gone. But there is a remnant group of people being prepared. And that remnant group of people being prepared, we believe we are a part of that group or or many or most of us here in this ministry, not because we just wish it to be, not because we desire it to be, but because of the evidence of the revelation. Why open up the books? Why reveal the mystery of the end of days to a group of people with a greater understanding than has ever been revealed before and can prove it from the beginning of creation to the end of revelation in hundreds and hundreds of videos? over and over and over again, showing the exact same thing of the first group, second group, and third group playing out in the entirety of the is to come if that group wasn't the group being prepared. Why would you give a, play group, a playbook and prepare a whole bunch of people on your team only to have the game time come and you tell them all to go home and give the book to a whole bunch of people that haven't yet been taught it? It absolutely makes no sense. Remember, as in heaven, so on the earth is always a people prepared. And that's what's going on here. This is what's taking place that you're going to see in the forum. Just people sharing in Bible studies. And, you know, sometimes there's just too much to get to. But you'll see things and you can comment on them. You could like them. You can, you can post your own things. And it's like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world. From Uganda to, to Australia to South Africa to Korea to parts of India to the UK, to Italy, all across Canada. I'm in Canada, in Calgary. 
down through the U.S. and Hawaii, South America, all over the world. So if you're a like-minded brother and sister seeking and searching and trying to understand prophecy better, come and join us and watch this playlist. You can watch tonight's teaching if you want. And if you're new, go back and watch this one, watch this one, and then watch the one that you're on right now. But I would also start right here with that playlist, then this one, then this one, and then the one you're watching right now. Because this will most likely <laughs> go over your head because we're going to get into some pretty uh, wild connections in all of this. All right. So with that, let's get the party started, man. This one is going to be pretty exciting. Not that they aren't usually, but you know what I'm saying, right? So you'll remember in the last teaching, we did this talk on booties, right? We know what booties represents. He's holding a staff. He's got a sickle. It, it relates to the star Arcturus and what this star represented and, and that it's the fourth brightest star in the sky, but it is the brightest star in the northern part. It is the star Arcturus, and it's in the constellation of excuse me, of booties. And this gets pretty wild. This is, it, it's, there's this play on words that I thought was so crystal clear. It was uncanny. You'll see what I'm talking about. I was talking about this with our brother, Roy. I was just talking about it with my wife again and just we're shaking our heads because the excitement of this, the excitement of diligently seeking and searching the Lord. We're not just going from event to event to event. There is, there are hundreds of videos hundreds of teachings revealing the revelation of the end and it has never deviated it's only been about when will this start and in the last couple teachings plus with this one seeing these connections at the end of 70 and where they are and what they equal and what they will be in the future oh my goodness it's it's wild it is so wild we we explain that's why i say if you haven't watched the last one watch the last one in this connection to booties, to understand that Arcturus is mentioned in the Bible. That one star, Arcturus, is mentioned in the Bible. You have Pleiades, which is a, which is a, star, uh, um, a star cluster in Taurus. You have um, uh, uh, Orion, which is a constellation. And you have Arcturus, which is a single star. A single star. Connected to booties, who is the herdsman, who has a sickle for harvesting. We saw how it's connected to Revelation 14, where they talk about it and its connection to it. So it's a picture of Christ, a herdsman who is the owner of the sheep and who is over the sheep but the shepherds. Remember that remnant group, a remnant group of people that will be over the shepherds, that will be over who? The saints. The saints are, are the church. The saints are the, the, the group going in the mid-trib great multitude rapture. That's who the shepherds are over, to lead them and to, and, and to guide them in this time of seals that are coming. When you see these connections, it is so wild, especially if you've been around for a while. Watch this. You saw in the last teaching, I explained something that is not only quite possible, but is appearing to be even more probable. And when we went to, for example... Let's go to Psalms as a little side note. You see, we've talked about Psalms 18 for a long time. Psalms 18 is a picture of the pre-trib is gone, and then chaos is going to break out while the seven-day wedding is taking place in heaven. And then the Lord is coming. He's going to bow the heavens, right? Uh, coming down on a cherub. He did fly. Uh, skies, his brightness was before him. Stones stones and coals of fire we see the channels of water the foundations of the earth are discovered he's taken a people out of that those see and the lord rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands we've talked about this in the past this is that remnant worker group that group that was prepared that he told in luke 12 to be ready when he returns from the wedding that when he knocks to be ready that when he knocks to be ready to open the door and that he will come and serve this group. He's going to take them to a place, to a large place, and this is when he has that banquet meal that comes after the seven-day uh, wedding feast that takes place in the third heaven. 
We know the powers these guys are going to be given, leaping over walls, bending bows of steel, because you got to remember the power and authority that's going to be taking place in the midst of tribulation has to be greater than anything given to people in history because it's going to be a time worse than at any point in history before. And then what happens? We've known this is the seven days. And Psalms 8, 19 is a picture of the heavens declaring the glory, the, the Lord coming as the bridegroom, coming out of his chamber, meaning he's been with his wife, and now he's coming at the circuit, like at the circuit of a year's end, right? A circuit, a lapse of time. It's not the sun. It relates to the star, to the star. That's what we were talking about in the last one. And this has to do with, with Psalms and the order of the book of Psalms in a specific grouping of chapters, again, that we've shared on for years. Same as John and his 21 to the 21, the first 21 chapters of Genesis. And what do we see in Genesis? It goes from chapter 7 into chapter 8. The seven days, the 40 days begin. Then in chapter 8, the 40 days come to an end. We go in John chapter 7. We go to the end of Tabernacles to the eighth day. And then boom, you go to chapter 8. It's a picture of the pre-trib. The bride is with them. And then you got the stone's throw. And then you got the Son of Man coming, starting his 40 days, who is the light shining in the darkness. It is so wild, guys. It is connected everywhere. Well, you'll remember in this previous teaching, when I spoke about these eight days, we know that in Luke's, Mark's after six days is after six years in the prophetic. Matthew's after six days is after six years in the prophetic. But in Luke's, the about eight days in the story of the transfiguration, they're all a picture of Christ coming as the Son of Man, as him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, and him coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, feet down on the Mount of Olives to start that 14th year. But this is a picture of two things, right? It's a picture of the years, meaning it's almost the eighth year, okay? Meaning in a 21-year picture, the first seven were easy, and it's almost the eighth. Because at this point, there's 40 days plus three before the 14 years will begin, okay? <clears throat> and so when we talked about this, and what is that 14th year? Well, year one is the eighth year in the picture of the 21 years. But it's also a picture of the Lord coming on the eighth day after the wedding. And we've shared on this many, many times. But in the last teaching, what I've shared on was the connection that the eight days when the Son of Man comes, as Jonah was, when he comes to shed his light in the darkness, after Israel will be attacked by Iran and maybe whoever's working with them, and Haifa and Tel Aviv will be, will be very, very decimated, and a Middle Eastern war will break out for about a week before it settles. That'll be the, during the wedding week. When the Lord comes on the eighth day, that will have settled when the wedding is done. They don't want to go into World War III. They're going to try to avoid it, but it's going to be coming shortly after. And then what happens? This eight days, I was showing as Mark's gospel, when we see in his transfiguration story, the after six days being the after six years, that I believe what we're seeing is the potential, and it's looking more likely that the eight days or the beginning of, of the 40 days of the Son of Man is the start of the first six years. Meaning, when the 40 days begin, at the eighth day, when the Son of Man comes, as Jonah was, that begins the six years as the six days. So it means that if, as we have understood, we've got the, uh, uh, where are we? Oops, down here. That we've got the pre-trib happening, and you've got day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Lord comes on the eighth day. So the 31st into the first, okay? So he's coming on the 31st to begin his eighth day, which would be October 31st. Meaning, when he comes at this time, that this appears to be the beginning of, of the six years that equals the end of the six years in Mark's transfiguration story. And we showed this, I showed this by giving an example 
or, or showing another place where it lines up is that we have six seals and then the seventh seal. Well, the Son of Man is the white horse rider, as we've proven. We've got a great video on it. Anybody that wants to understand the white horse rider better, come and watch this video right here. This teaching is going to prove to you that the Son of Man coming for 40 days is the white horse rider. And so if the, the first seals are coming and the first seal actually stands on his own but is part of the grouping, you see, a lot of people say, well, if... If the Son of Man, if Jesus is the one opening the seals, how can he be the white horse rider? Well, you get the answer in verse 1 of Revelation 6. The Lamb opened one of the seals. He opened one of, which means the first of the seals. And when he opened the first seal, he goes out as the white horse rider, who is the one to warn Jerusalem, who is the Son of Man as Jonah was, as the, as the 40 days for Noah. And when the 40 days are over, he goes, just like he did in Acts chapter 1, at the end of 40 days, they saw him go up. He leaves. And when he leaves, there's three more days, an anointing of the Holy Ghost on day 50, and then the 14 years begin. There's still a 14-year play out, even though the six would begin at the start of his 40 days. And then what happens? Then he opens the second seal. You see? there, It's it's. When you, when you understand these little intricacies, you see it more clearly in the details of the words. It's this paying attention. It's this when the understanding is opened, you, you spend more and more time and you dig out more and you find more and there's more minutia and more detail. And it gets more and more clear. So what we're seeing then is this being the beginning of his 40 days. I mean, the, the beginning from the eighth day which would be August 31st. He's here for 40 days, and it would begin the six years, and the six years would end when he's coming, and it's the great day of his wrath. His, the great day of the Lord is coming. This is when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is a picture of him coming right here. And as we've said before, and we're going to be talking on this later, which is connected to the time of the end of Elijah's portion. But we'll talk on that later in the other stuff, the extra worldly things that we were talking about uh, earlier. So if that's the case, which it really looks to be, then what we end up seeing is here's the beginning of his 40 days on Halloween, right? On October 31st. And the end of his six years would be on Halloween. It's pretty wild. Okay? But why is it wild? Well, you'll have to wait a couple more minutes to find out what that's all about. You'll see what I'm talking about. Well, <clears throat> now look what happens. In the the story of Arcturus, the the fourth brightest star in the sky, <clears throat> the the brightest one in the northern hemisphere. Remember, they say with a sickle and everything else, he's called the herdsman, so he's connected to Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, which has always been a picture that we've taught of the Son of Man coming for the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. So <clears throat> what I was talking about in the last teaching was this picture of this timing of Arcturus right now on October 31st, rising and setting at the same time, at the same place as the sun did at the, at the equinox, being a representation of that year's end here for the Lord coming, but not as the sun, but as the representation of that star, Arcturus. That star that is moving like the sun at this time, not the fallen sun, but the star that it's in its that's in its place, which is in the north, and is the brightest star in the north. And after six years, <clears throat> it would equal, if the six years begin at the 40, it would fall again on October 31st into November 1st. And that is going to be very, very telling. And the understanding is already given to us by him being this representation with this sickle 
with the, the guy with the, the staff. He's a star. He's a sickle. Oh, you're going to see what that connects to, right? Let me show you. What if we go into Revelation chapter 2? We've, in, our, in the book, in the Ministry Revealed book, but even in other teachings, we have, I think even in the, um, in the intro series, as you, as you get through the, the intros, you'll find the one on the seven churches. It will blow your mind. We've got the mystery of the revelation of the seven churches. And the end of the sixth, uh, the end of the, the sixth year of seals is the exact same timing as the end of Thyatira. We're going to touch on it a little bit more as we go further in, but we see the same thing. Look at this. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Well, what, is, what does Booties have? He's a picture of the one holding the rod of iron, right? And then in verse 28, it says, And I will give him the morning star. Who's the morning star? Christ is a morning star. Well, what do we see as this star? It was rising on Halloween. It rises and sets as the sun in the same position as the sun in Arcturus. Uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Booties. And it's the star of Arcturus, which is the star of the north. The brightest star in the north, and we know what comes from the north at the end of the sixth year of seals, just like in Revelation 6, which is the end of Revelation chapter 2 in the seven churches. It's the exact same picture, and it's telling us a guy with a, with a rod, he's a star. And in Revelation 14, he's the one with the sickle, because why? Well, then it will be the time for the harvesting of the saints. Hello. The great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year of seals. He comes and it's the time of the harvest. But what do we know? It won't be observed, right? Until about seven months later, six or seven months later, in the midst of the seventh year of seals, when that full rapture multitude comes in. Again, how can we know this? We've taught on this in Mark's transfiguration story. When it says in verse 9-1, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death. This is the great multitude rapture group, which shall not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, the kingdom of God come with power. They will have seen it come with power. When do they see it come? At the end of the sixth year of seals, which is at the end of six days, or in the prophetic six years. They're seeing him come on heavenly Mount Zion. Which is coming from where? We'll talk about that a little bit more. But remember, he's co it's coming from the north. You see all these connections? It's absolutely mind-blowing. All of these connections. And we have Arcturus mentioned in Scripture. And this is the time of that rising with Arcturus. Even times as the sun in the same place. Like a shadow of the sun. But what? That never lost its course, right? still in the, the firmament. In, and in the constellation of booties, in the constellation of booties, you're going to want to remember that one, in the constellation of booties, and is the sheep herder, the owner of the sheep. And the workers are what? Well, this is the day of the workers. When the Lord comes on the eighth day and comes and knocks on the door, he is the sheep herder, and you've got now the shepherds, and the shepherds are going to be keeping watch and protecting and healing and all sorts of things over the sheep, over his flock. And this is the date. Arcturus in booties. Yeah, I'm emphasizing that for a reason. <laughs> Check this out. Look where it leads. Watch this. I did a teaching maybe a couple months ago. Oh. Four, four to five months ago now. Remember this one? For those that have been around for a little bit, this one on the book of Zephaniah. Well, if you'll recall, in this teaching, I revealed that prophetic revelation of the book of Zephaniah, <coughs> which is written to the house of Judah, is talking about the beginning, the middle, and the end. The pre, the mid, the post. Now, when I say pre, mid, and post, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not talking to it, or I'm not talking about it 
as a pre to the Gentiles being taken. I'm talking about to the portion allocated that's going to happen pre to the Jews and then mid and then post. Okay, we I revealed all of this in this teaching. It was wild because it was another open book that we've revealed. So let me show you just a, a simple little glimpse into the headings of Zephaniah and what was revealed. And I'll just use the headings. The coming judgment on Judah. He's going to consume them all off the land. Well, we know that happens at the end of 50 days. The start of the 14th, at the red horse rider, they're going to be consumed off the land. <clears throat> then we come to chapter 2. Look at the heading. Uh, judgment on Judah's enemies. That's because at the end of the six year of seals, when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, it's the Ezekiel 39 war. Everybody thinks Ezekiel 39 is coming now. That's because they only have a seven year understanding. This is why I keep harping on the importance of the 14 years that comes from the revelation of understanding who the Gospels are speaking to. Because Judah is going to be removed from the land for their error, for their corruption. They're going to be removed for, from the land because the land has not had its time to rest so that the Lord can have the temple built on it. And it must rest for seven years. So they're going to be removed from the land for seven years. But at the end of the sixth year, that's the timing of the Ezekiel 39 war. So why do you think everybody now thinks is the Ezekiel 39 war? Because they don't see the first seven years that come before the Ezekiel 39 war and then the great multitude rapture and then the next seven years that follow. They think it's Ezekiel 39 at the time of the of the rapture. That's going to be everybody. And then seven year of Jacob's trouble only. They've missed the first seven. We reveal in Zephaniah what happens first, then what happens mid and then what happens post. And then look what happens in chapter three. Judgment on Jerusalem and the nations. Exactly. It's the seventh. It's the, the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet at the coming of the Lord. It's Zechariah chapter 14. There's judgment coming on Jerusalem and then all of the nations. That's what's coming. We showed it in, a, in what happens in the beginning, the mid and the post over the 14 year revelation. Now, the reason I went to look up this teaching that I did on Zephaniah was because I recalled something in the book of Zephaniah that everybody loves to go to in prophecy circles. Many, I would say it's probably been decades. I've been probably into prophecy for about 10 years, teaching for seven. And over the years, how many times have you heard people go to Zephaniah chapter one to try to explain a pre-trib connection. I'm sure everybody listening has heard this before. Every time October 31st is coming near, you will see people teaching on prophecy going to Zephaniah chapter 1 to talk about how it sounds like Halloween and that they think it's connected to the pre-trib. Well, I can tell you unequivocally, it's not connected to the pre-trib. It's connected to the coming of the Son of Man when he's going to be warning Jerusalem and when he's coming on that eighth day. Remember, what is this eighth day? <laughs> Booties with the star Arcturus. Or Arcturus. So the constellation of booties with the star Arcturus. All right? So I thought, now, this isn't initially why I went to Zephaniah. It wasn't because of what I'm about to show you, but I went to it because of what I've heard people talking about, and I think I even talked about it in the past, of the wording that comes in Zephaniah that sounds very, what I say, Halloween-y. Okay? It has a Halloween-sounding context to it. Now, can it really be Halloween in, in Zephaniah when it's talking to the house of Judah? No, it's not really about Halloween. <clears throat> but in the prophetic, in, in an insight into it, maybe it is connected to the timing of Halloween. And I might just be able to connect it more as you're about to see. Look at what it says. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2. 
I will utterly consume all things off the land. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen at the end of 50 days at the Red Horse Rider. Boom, Jerusalem will be attacked, having been compassed about and then attacked and destroyed. And they will flee. They will go into the wilderness. They will go into hiding. They will be taken captive. And they will be removed from the land during the time of seals with a small contingent that will be allowed at one point to come back but they're only going to get the foundation of the new temple built. Only that will end up getting done. And then everything will be, will be stopped until the Lord comes. And then this beginning of trumpets, they will literally begin the, th the third temple. Okay? That's why, again, everybody talks about the third temple, the third temple. The, the, the temple's got to be built. And not until mid-temple built, then the Antichrist comes. Well, it's because they're seeing only seven years. They mix it all together because they only see seven. They only read from foundationally from Matthew. So they only see seven years. And so they twist everything into this crazy knot. You see? But when you understand the above in the 14 years, poof, everything starts to open up. And it comes first from the understanding of the Gospels. So he's telling them they're going to be consumed off the land. I will consume men and beast. I will consume howl, uh, uh, Sorry, the fowls of the heaven, the fishes of the sea, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land. Let me show you this. This is exactly what we told, what we share with you guys in Luke chapter 19 as well. In Luke chapter 19, it's the same thing. The triumphal entry in Luke, Mark, and Matthew is the same prophetic picture as the Mount Transfiguration of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's a picture of the coming of the Lord in the 40 days, the end of seals, and the end of trumpets. They are all giving different little insights into what's taking place, prophetically laced in to these three. And so here's the triumphal entry. It's a picture of the Son of Man coming to begin his 40 days. And then look what comes next. You only find this in Luke's. He weeps over Jerusalem. So listen to what it says. Wept over the city, saying, If thou had known even this at least... If at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast the trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall leave, and they shall not leave in thee, one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. This is the exact same wording that you're reading over there in Zephaniah. We show this exact same connection in Luke chapter 21 as well. In Luke chapter 21, the picture of the Son of Man warning about Jerusalem. This is prophetic. This is him in the 40 days warning as he was doing there in in luke 19 where he's warning and when jerusalem shall be compassed about then know that the desolation thereof is nigh let, don't let everybody come in everybody depart for these be the days of the ve of vengeance of all things which are written but woe unto them that are with children and then to give suck in those days many will fall it says by the edge of the sword and be led away captive and trodden down it's the same story this is what's coming at the end of the 50 days and the start of the 14 years at the red horse rider. So now, when we go back into Zephaniah, we know this is that timing. This It's the same story of the Lord talking and, and the, the representation of this timing of him coming. Now look at what it says. Uh, Zephaniah 1.5. Oh no, let's go 4. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the cherubims, which is the idolatrous priests, with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon housetops, which, by the way, they, they observe on housetops uh, tabernacles as well. So the timing is, is right in that timing. And them that worship and swear by the Lord and swear by Malcolm, by, by Mal, Malcolm, uh, how do you say that one? Malcolm. Malcolm, I always mess up these Hebrew names, man. Verse 6, 
them that are turned back from and end them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Listen what comes. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, and he hath bid, cleansed, purified his guests, his invited, his called out ones. Now here comes this peace that so many people over decades have gone to to believe there's this connection to Halloween. And this is why I came back to it because I remembered this conversation over the years of people going to it for Halloween. But we also did a teaching on it. So it reminded me, wait a second. Not only is there this conversation that sounds like Halloween, but we just did a teaching of the pre-mid post of it, of the, of the comings of the Lord of it in relation to the house of Judah. So we already know that Zephaniah chapter 1 is about the beginning and the Lord coming for 40 days and the warning and everything that's about to come against Jerusalem. And what did we just, what were we just recently talking about? We've just been talking about in the last two teachings the connection that the pre-trib comes from right here, from the end of John 7. And it takes us to John 8 right here. It's the pre-trib, the wedding to the eighth day and the Lord coming at the time of Halloween. So it reminded me after these last two <clears throat> to go look at Halloween. And while in it, I was reminded that we just did the teaching a few months ago. But now, what did we just teach on in the last one? The connection to booties and the star Arcturus. Or Arcturus. So let's see what all of this now says. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed in strange apparel, okay? Like adulterous, foreigners, okay? Strange apparel. So a lot of people associate this with a connection to Halloween. And the reason is if you read more, look what comes next. In the same day, also will I punish all that leap on the threshold. What's the threshold? Like the sill of the door. So you've got people dressed in strange apparel. You've got people leaping on the threshold like the sill of the door, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Isn't, aren't people deceiving and being deceitful and, and being in costume and strange apparel and, and deceiving the way Halloween is being treated? And what they do at Halloween? So here we are at the time when we know it relates to the coming of the Son of Man on the eighth day. We now know the connection is with booties and the star Arcturus. We know it's, it's equal to October 31st, which is Halloween. This isn't about the pre-trip. This is when he comes on the eighth day because this is about the story of Judah when he's coming to warn them that they're going to be removed from the land. And the conversation starts with this with this with this uh, a strange apparel of clothing <clears throat> on the threshold like the sill of a door and this deceitfulness taking place in it. Well, wait a second. Didn't I say something about booties as well? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 10, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be a noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and great uh, from the from the second and a great crashing from the hills a destruction a breach a fracture okay a bursting a, a destroying this this is this this is what's coming now when is this coming at the beginning of of the 40 days no this is part of his warning at this time of halloween of what's coming in their destruction. So there's going to be a crashing. Well, let's keep reading. It talks about the inhabitants, uh, merchants of silver being cut off, thinking their silver will save them. Now look at, look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles. Okay, let me check. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on. Does that sound familiar? We know the Lord is coming to shine his light in the darkness, right? Remember, Isaiah chapter 9. The light affliction of Zebulun and of Talon, and then there's going to be a more grievous one that's coming to Jerusalem. And what does he say? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them hath the light shined. What else do we get from this? We know from Luke chapter 21, what we were saying earlier, this is him when he comes for his 40 days, having come when it's this darkness because of this attack that had already taken place in the north, and there's darkness, and he's coming to shine his light, and he's warning as he is in Zephaniah chapter 1 of what's coming next to Jerusalem. Watch this. Does this ring a bell? How about Luke chapter 11? In Luke chapter 11, we have one of those differences in the Gospels, and Luke's is when Jesus says he will be as Jonah was. He's going to be to this generation, which represents the final generation. What is he going to be? He's going to be a warning unto the world or unto Judah as Jonah was to Nineveh. What was he a warning of? Forty days. This is the Lord coming to warn as Jonah did for 40 days. And what do we see? Only in Luke's gospel, after the, the Jonah story and him being as Jonah was, you only find this in Luke's gospel. In verse 33, he goes on to say, light, light, or lighted, light, candlestick, light, 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 <laughs> candle. You get the picture? What is he coming to do? He's coming as that candle, as that light in the darkness. Just as he showed, just as we talked about in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 does the exact same thing as, as uh, Isaiah chapter 9. We see it starts with the pre-trib, that, that end of Luke 21 right here. The woman's there with him, before him. The stone's throw is coming. And then what do we see? And Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's the same conversation. It's when he's coming to begin his 40 days as light, shining his light in the darkness. And when he's coming at this time, remember when he comes at this time, which is equivalent to, this year <clears throat> to October 31st, the eighth day, he's coming to who first? He's coming to the remnant workers, that remnant group, that Elijah company that's been prepared, that we've been teaching on for years, and that we recently, over the last couple or so years, came to understand a connection to a teacher. But it's this Elijah company being prepared. And I'm not the only one talking about it. People have been talking about it for a long time. And there's a group of people being prepared that have revelation. Like I said earlier, you don't take them out of the game, give the playbook to people that haven't understood it. You see, because it's got to be as in heaven, so on the earth. So look at what we see next. We see now this context. And now watch what happens next. Verse 13. Therefore, their goods shall be a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall build, they, sh they shall also build houses and not inhabit them, okay, because they're going to be taken captive and so forth, right? Look at this word booty. Why is the word booty used here? Look at what the word booty means. The spoils, right? They're going to plunder or spoil. See? To plunder, rifle, rifle or spoil. Why use the word booty? Why not? It's only used five, I think it's five times or maybe six times in uh, when we go to blue letter. It's only used five times for this spoil that's being taken. And they use the word booty. Do you find that interesting that they use the word booty? When we're connecting this time to booties which booties is the connection to 
October 31st, and the star Arcturus, it's literally connected to October 31st when the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days on the eighth day, which will be also the beginning of the six years. On a time when they use the word booty. Now, this is when I was talking to Roy, and Roy was kind of scratching his head at first, too, because he's like, but, but it, it means loot, right? To take a spoil, like the pirates used to do, right? The loot, the booty. Yes, that's, that's definitely what it means. But when I told you I'm taking you into to a, a layer, like a little pulling back the curtain and seeing and asking the question, why would you use the word booty only here? where it's talking about this coming of the Lord to shine his light in the darkness when he's going to be warning Judah that begins his 40 days at the time with a conversation of Halloween when it's in booties at the time when it's going to come, when he's coming, and he is a representation of that star in booties, the brightest star in the north. And it uses the word booty. But the word booty just means a spoil, so why not use the word spoil? And this is why I say, why not use the word spoil? <clears throat> if you go look it up, see here in blue letter, it tells you it's used six times. Look, spoil, 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 booties, and booty. Why? What is the purpose when the word is supposed to mean, <coughs> excuse me, the exact same thing. And when you go to the greater definition or the deeper definition, it just says plunder, uh, spoil. Why have booty at all? There's no difference in the context, apparently, from using the word spoil to suddenly using the word booty. Except if there is a deeper, prophetic, spirit-led purpose for why the word booty was used instead of simply spoil again. Because it does mean spoil. What's it, the rabbit, uh, um, They're going through their houses, right? And they're taking, their, they're taking the spoil. That's clearly what it is. But is it possible that it's also a, a, a layered clue to this timing of the entirety of this revelation to the timing of booties that we've been talking about and that we've been pointing to in the last two teachings, the last one with booties, and now building into this, when we've done the teaching on Zephaniah, knowing it's a picture of the Son of Man when he comes for his 40 days, and it's talking about the word booty? I find that very, very interesting of this connection right here. And for me, I believe it is prophetically tied in there for that reason so that we can understand. And I believe it is helping us. I pray and I believe that it is helping to confirm for us this timing of booties, which is the star Arcturus, the brightest star in it. But I want to show you something else. There's only one other place where it's used. <clears throat> it's used in Habakkuk chapter 2. Wait a second. Habakkuk chapter 2. So the only other place where the context of this one is used, one is a picture where it's the Son of Man coming for 40 days when it's the timing of booties and the, and the, and the brightest star in it called Arcturus, and they use the word booty. In the story of Zephaniah, chapter 1, that we revealed over four months ago, showing that it's a picture of the Son of Man when he comes to warn Judah. Well, check the other piece out. The only other place it's used is in Habakkuk chapter 2. And in Habakkuk chapter 2, it's in verse 7, it says, Shall they not rise up suddenly uh, that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee, 
and thou shalt be for booties unto them. So again, it's a spoil, right? But look, here's the word spoiled, right? To plunder, to take spoil. <laughs> it's, it's used once here. It's used another time right here. But for these two spoilings, it uses the word booty and booties. The one in Zephaniah to begin the 40 days of the Son of Man, which is at booties, <laughs> right? But what makes this one so wild as well that booties would be mentioned in the context of Habakkuk chapter 2? Well, <clears throat> let me remind you, and I'm going to say, take it with a grain of salt, as much salt as you need. Many people have tracked it. Many people have followed it. Many people have understood it. I have studied it intensely because of what's been going on with me in the last seven years. I believe it's possible, even more probable, but I'm, I, I can't say with a certainty, except that if we look at the last seven years of Revelation, it appears to point, <coughs> excuse me, in our direction. So why is the word booties, <coughs> excuse me, so why is the word booties such a big deal to be in the conversation in Habakkuk chapter 2? Well, let me read it again for you. Let me read this for you. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, conventionally a year, a festival, a solemn assembly. Hello? But at the end, at the end, okay? At the end of days, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Do you guys remember what this conversation is about? This conversation is prophetically speaking about a person that would be at the time of the end revealing these things that are the mysteries in the prophets and in the law of Moses that were mysteries hidden since the beginning of creation and wouldn't be revealed until this person and this group of people in the final generation. And we have the word booties. What am I talking about? Well, for those that have been around for a bit, again, this is the eighth day. This is that time of booties with that star. This is Zephaniah 1 where the word booty is used. And now we're going to look at the other place where the word booties is used in the same context. And we're going to see if the connection is to this as well. Listen to this. This is the story of the breakdown of that from the book of Habakkuk, okay? Whoops. This is from the story of Habakkuk and its breakdown. Listen to this. You guys have heard this before if you've been around for a while, but there's a reason why I'm showing you this now because it just might be pointing to us with greater detail, with pinpoint accuracy to this date, a group of who? A group of people being prepared? Well, remember, there's a 2,200-year-old writing of this teacher of righteousness, and we've talked about what it means and what it says about him. That he would be revealed these things, led by the Spirit, not a prophet like the, prophet of, like the prophets of old, because they had visions and dreams and visitations. But he would be able to do it through the leading of the Spirit who would open unto him his understanding of the prophets of the law and of so forth. Well, that's what's been happening here to these mysteries that have never been understood before. And there's a conversation within it about Habakkuk. So let's read a little bit and let's see what it says about this. The Peshurim, which means, let me show you, which means interpretation, okay? So, so the, interpre uh, the interpretation 10 are interpretations 
of written prophetic texts that can be understood as unraveling of mysteries. J. Karmanak broke the interpretations into two categories. Continuous, which interpret a single book section by section. Hello. We've been doing that with a lot of them, right? That's what we did with John, with the book of John. That's what we've done with Hosea, with Zechariah. But what do we do a lot, like what's going on tonight? And thematic, which consists of certain citations grouped ra around a certain them uh, thematic idea. Where you go from here and you take pieces here and pieces there and parts there. And you show the picture of it built in together showing this imagery all tied in together. That's what we do. Both of these forms of interpretations are characterized by Raz, a term taken from the notion of the ancient prophets being introduced in their vision into the heavenly assembly of special knowledge. However, the interpretation takes the idea of divine prophetic revelation a step further because they claim to contain the mystery of things hidden even to the prophets themselves who wrote the words now being interpreted. Being interpreted by who? The teacher, the teacher of righteousness. And it's happening to the final generation. Listen to this. And God took Habakkuk, uh, sorry, and God told Habakkuk to write down that which would happen to the final generation. But he did not make known to him when the time would come to an end. And as far, uh, and for that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and as for that, which he said, that he who reads may read it speedily. Remember, we were just talking in Habakkuk chapter 2. And in Habakkuk chapter 2, we're seeing this word booties used. And the connection to Habakkuk chapter 2 in this timing is about the teacher of righteousness and the community of people who are a group of remnant people being prepared for the time of the end. And the word booties is in there. You'll see the connection in a minute. That he who reads may read it speedily. Interpreted this concern, concerns the teacher of righteousness to whom God made known all the mysteries of the word, the words of his servants, the prophets. In this pressure, the teacher understands what is to come because God allows him to unravel the mystery of Habakkuk's prophecy. Namely, that the words within God's buried, God buried his plans for the founding of the community, the rise of the teacher, and the end of days. Only God gives the teacher prophetic understanding. The teacher unravels the mysteries in scripture, and he uses the new knowledge to create rules which regulate the community. In this manner, the entire community order every rule, hierarchical, hierarchical, I don't know why I can't say that, position is governed by the teacher interpreting the scripture in the anticipation of the end of days. Moreover, because the teacher is an interpreter of law, the interpretations provide additional insight into the teacher. That is, these interpretations are the teacher's mode of divine revelation via interpretation of scripture. Ready for this? Watch this. This passage reveals the uh, much about the community's theology and prophecy. The teacher was chosen by God, uh, long ago by God, to prepare a remnant for the end of days. Who would be a group prepared for the end of days but those being given the revelation of prophecy to understand the layer beneath the prophets that they didn't understand because it was reserved for this group of people led by the teacher in the end of days. And what did it say about them? Prepared remnant for the end of days. What is it connected to? The book of Habakkuk, specifically Habakkuk chapter 2. Whoops. Specifically Habakkuk, where is it? I don't know why I don't have that there. But specifically Habakkuk chapter 2, speaking about this person 
and the community together as a whole. Brothers and sisters, you want to know why this connection is wild? It's only used twice, as we just discussed. The first time it's discussed, or the first place I showed you with the term booty being used, is connected to the timing of the Son of Man when he's coming to warn Judah, beginning his 40 days, in the timing of the constellation of booties and the star Arcturus. The other place, the only other place in the context of that word where booties is used, is talking about the teacher of righteousness and his community who are a group of people who are a remnant being prepared for the time of the end. And this remnant being prepared for the time of the end are who? Well, they're called the Elijah Company. There's an Elijah and the company of Elijahs. When did the Lord say he would come back for them? When did the Lord acknowledge this group and tell them that he would come back for this remnant group of people prepared? You know it very well. Luke 21, 35, uh, Luke 12, 35, sorry. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and he will come forth and serve them. This is that first watch, that Smyrna remnant group with their loins being girded about, waiting for him to return from the wedding. And when he returns from the wedding, what is he going to do? He's coming to knock. When does he return from the wedding? On the eighth day. When he returns from the wedding on the eighth day, in booties, as booty is in Zephaniah chapter 1, he's coming to this remnant group of prepared people with the teacher and their community who are a remnant people prepared for the time of the end and in that same book, in that same chapter, a couple verses later, says the word booties. When is the Lord coming for that group when he returns from the wedding, which is the Smyrna group prepared, the Luke 24 remnant, the Elijah company? When is it? The eighth day at the time of booties. <laughs> Come on. It's only used twice, guys. One time, it's used at the timing of the Lord when he starts his 40 days. The other timing is the timing of the teacher and the community that's with him who are the remnant prepared for the time of the end, which is the exact same time when the Lord comes to begin his 40 days on the eighth day when he returns from the wedding. There's the Lord in booty, and there's the remnant group with the teacher at the time in booties. Come on. Come on. When they could have just used spoil the whole way through like the other four times? Do you think that's just by chance? This is unbelievable. It's, it's too, you know, I was telling my wife about it over dinner before the teaching. And she's like, you know, we, we just shake our head. She's like, you... You can't make this stuff up. Do you understand? Not a single thing I just shared with you was from my own thoughts. It's all written down. It's things from thousands of years ago with events that have been playing out over hundreds of years. It's impossible to make up. They're all literal timings and events and things that have been written about. It turns out the timing of all of them is in booties with Arcturus, the brightest star in the north, with the guy who is the who is the the herdsman constellation with the staff and with the sickle. And he's represented as the star. The brightest star in the north, which is where the Lord comes from with paradise at the end of seals. Come on. I think that, yes, of course it means spoil. But the two places it's used? Who, who could have figured that out? 
that would make no sense for anybody to consider what I just shared with you. Because it's impossible to understand without the understanding of what's coming at the beginning of tribulation played out throughout the revelation of the Gospels over the 14 years, the period above, understanding the Son of Man is coming first, that he's coming as light, that there's a remnant group staying, that this remnant group is a group being prepared through a person bringing about revelation that's spirit-led, different than what the prophets of old have been revealed. This can't be made up. It's too crazy to make up. It's all right there in words that were read. It's unbelievable. It just, I shake my head when I go through this stuff because it is so, come on. How is this to be real? How can we continuously, hundreds and hundreds of videos and teachings, and it all equals the exact same storyline every time. And now here we are at the time of the end, having looked at this timing based on this video, not having yet have been revealed and led through our brother in the forum, having talked about Arcturus and the star, then talked about in this one, to then be led into all of this by going back to the storyline of Halloween and to see that booties Arcturus and the word booties is there or booty is there. And that the other place it's used is in the place with the teacher of righteousness. So you've got the Lord and you've got the teacher of righteousness who was prepared by the spirit of the Lord when that timing would come. And both of them are the same date when booties is there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So wild. Right. And then so then that's why I say when I was talking in the beginning. And you take the the story of how we've got John now in order there. We've got, of course, we've always had uh, Genesis 7, 8 and, John, and Genesis in order. We've got the Psalms now there in order. Um, we had what we've been looking at since last year, as I said in the last one, when we were looking to August 12th and the Lord coming about two months later after his birth. But now what did we do? We, I said, wait a second. In the last teaching, and I'd realized, hold on, we need to be counting from Taurus. And when we counted from Taurus at the full moon as it was this year in the solstice, which used to be in the equinox, and we did that count like that being the beginning, we got to October 31st as the time being two months after Jesus' birth, which was the revelation from like a year and a half, two years ago. In the story from Isaiah 9 to Matthew chapter 4, it equals October 31st as well. So we have the story from John that goes from the end of the Jews' feast to the start with the pre-trib. We got the story from Isaiah chapter 9 when he's coming about two months later connected to Matthew chapter 4, which told us John was now in prison, which means it was about two months after Jesus' birthday. And this is the date that it equals from the time of Jesus' birth two months later on a Taurus beginning of the year at the solstice. And then what do we get? Then on top of all of that, we get the connection to Arcturus and it being in booties and the timing of it being as the sun to connect Psalms from 18 into 19. And now we got the two places of booty and booties, both equaling also the timing of the eighth day at the coming of the Son of Man for that remnant worker group. And who is that remnant worker group? Smyrna. Smyrna, of course, right? They're the ones who will put their necks on the line. Some will be cast into prison. Some will be put to death. But this is the group who the Lord will resurrect to rule and reign with them because they served him for his people and will endure things as Christ endured and will put their necks on the line. This is the Elijah company, that Moses and Elijah company. And they will put their necks on the line and they will take part in the resurrection of the just, which is called the first resurrection. These are the ones that will not be hurt by the second death because they will be the ones sitting with Christ 
in his throne as he sits with his fathers in his during the time of the millennial reign where they will rule and reign with him. This is that company being spoken about. It's wild. Well, watch what else this leads to. Because all of this is the eighth day. All of this that I've been talking about equals from the pre-trib equals to the eighth day, starts on the 31st and goes into the 1st of November. Okay? Starts at Halloween. And, when, and it's funny, right? Because when the Lord comes on the eighth day, what is he coming to do? He's coming to knock on the door. He's coming to knock on the door at the time when people are going around in strange apparel coming to the sills of the door knocking with deception with deception of what Halloween is, right? Trick or treat. And he's coming to knock at the time of booties, the star, Arcturus, when they're knocking on doors. I think we're going to have to be standing right near our door watching for people coming. We're, we're going to have to open everybody because we don't know which one will be the Lord. You know, it's it's wild, wild stuff, man. I don't know that it's a physical knock at the door or if it's a spiritual knock and we're to be ready, right? We're to be ready when he comes back on that eighth day. It's, it is so wild, so wild. But remember, we're still talking about October 31st, okay? What do we know? What else do we know <clears throat> about October 31st, brothers and sisters? Well, let me show you. October 31st is also the Reformation, brothers and sisters. It is the date of the Reformation. Check this out. The Protestant Reformation began in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st. October 31st. <laughs> Do you know why this is so crazy? Let me show you. You see, we've broken all these things down in the revelation of the end of days for the seven churches. We've talked about this many, many times with you guys, right? We've taught on it. It's, I, I mentioned it earlier because it's absolutely incredible. If once you begin, if you're new and you begin to understand that intro series and you go through more of those intro series, don't, I mean, you could binge watch. I just had a couple more people tell me that they're new to the channel this month or last month and they started binge watching and they were blown away. That's what happens to people who are thirsty, that they don't just dismiss it as somebody who's crazy. Oh, 14 years, whatever, who the Gospels are speaking to. They don't know what they're talking about. No, for those who take the time, 22 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. That's not too much time to take just to, to see if there's something there. To, to be open and ask the Spirit to lead you in the understanding. Because when you get to this story of the seven churches in, in, the, in the teaching that you're going to see in that intro series, oh my goodness, it is the revelation of the entirety of the end of days. It's absolutely incredible. Let me show you what I mean and lead you to what I'm talking about with the Reformation. Because what you see here is the was of history, okay? From, from the Old Testament. How there's a, a typology in Ephesus in the Old Testament of Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, okay? Oops, and Laodicea, okay? There's, there's a typology all throughout the Old Testament of those seven churches. And this played out over what? About 2,500 years. And then from Christ, the time of the apostolic age, until the time we're living in right now, which is the, 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 time, the age of apostasy, where Judah has their kings. You see, Israel scattered. It's, it's the house of Judah that's in the land, right? So we're in this very late, 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 late stage of la the Laodicean age. And this has played out over about 2,000 years. Well, what about the end of days? In the end of days, 
what played out over 2,500 years, over 2,000 years, in the end of days, will play out over 50 days and 14 years. The entirety of the seven churches of Revelation will play out again over 50 days and 14 years. It's absolutely wild. And in that teaching, you will see it broken down. And we're going to talk a little bit about it here to get to the connection to the Reformation connection. All right? So this is what happens. At the moment of the pre-trib, it goes back. The seven churches have started over. Soon as, boom. So the Lord will inform like he did in Revelation 12. <coughs> Excuse me. He will inform like he did in Revelation 12. He will inform the Smyrna workers, those that will be his servants, the disciples. He's going to inform them right before, shortly before the pre-trib happens, as we saw there in, Reve in, in uh, sorry, Luke 12. He's going to inform them to be ready when he returns from the wedding. Then what happens? Bang. The pre-trib happens, and the 50 days begin. The end of days will officially now begin. <clears throat> and it starts with Ephesus. This will be the period of the apostles and the beginning of the apostolic age, this, this greatest revival in human history that people have been talking about for decades, now it's going to begin in the midst of chaos. Tens of millions of people will have vanished, and chaos will start to break out around the world, and of course, Israel in the north will be attacked. So, what do we see? It begins with the 50 days, that starts with what? The seven days. Well, what did it equal historically? In the Old Testament, in the was, the time of the day of Israel's espousals. Well, what's happening during the first week of tribulation? There's the Lord's wedding in heaven. He's anointed. He, he leaves, takes the pre-trib rapture. He comes back on the same day at evening, it says in John 20, and he's going to anoint the apostles by blowing on them. And then he leaves and he returns on the eighth day, which will begin the 40 days of the above 50 with Smyrna. And what's happening during that week? The espousals. Just like it prophetically connected in the Old Testament. Then when he returns after the seven days on the eighth day, what day is that? That would be October 31st when he comes on the eighth day. When he comes on the eighth day, he's coming to that Smyrna company. Okay, who is this Smyrna company? It's that remnant group prepared. Those who were a part of the ready bride group that were watching and praying, diligently seeking. They were like the Enoch group of people, right? They diligently sought the Lord, believing that he was a rewarder of those who diligently sought him. But they were chosen. That's why the Lord instructs them in Luke 12, 35. He instructs them to let them know before the pre-trib happens that they're being chosen to remain. And then he takes the pre-trib so these guys aren't left freaking out. They know that they've been chosen. They've been prepared, and now he's going to let them know. When he returns on the eighth day, this would be October 31st, okay? This is the beginning of the 40 days. Now, what was I saying earlier? That it would appear, even according to the seals, that the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man, which is the start of Smyrna, the beginning of the 40 days, which is Luke's discourse, when he's warning Jerusalem that being comes about, like Zephaniah chapter 1, which is connected to Habakkuk with the teacher of righteousness with this group of people in the community that were prepared are now there on the eighth day together. He knocked on the door and he's going to bring them to a large place, right? He's going to gather them, bring them to a large place, and that's where he has the banquet meal with that remnant group. We've seen that exact same story that we've broken down in Luke 14. Luke 14 has the wedding, and then after the wedding, you have a banquet meal. Only Luke's has that. Only Luke's has that banquet meal after the wedding. That's this group here of Smyrna. That's the remnant group. And what were we saying earlier about this from the last teaching? That it would appear that the six years, just like when the seals start, they begin at the start of the 40 days of the Son of Man, which is the beginning of Smyrna, and they go to the end of six years. Which means the start of the 40 days and the end of the six years okay the end of the six to day one of the seventh okay it's essentially the same october 31st to november 1st you could say right so if it starts october 31st and it ends when the lord comes again at the sixth at the end of six years 
it would be October 31st to, to, uh, to November 1st, just like the 40 days that started. Okay, so that would be your six years from this line right here in the beginning of Smyrna, the start of his 40 days, to the end of the six years, this line right here from Thyatira to Sardis. What do we know happens in that time? This represents persecution starting against these guys. It will really, really start quickly against the apostles and the disciples that are there also. I don't know if it's still going to be 12 the apostles again. Uh, I believe so. But the Smyrna, I believe it'll be 24,000. Some believe it'll be 144,000. Not the same 144,000 as Philadelphia, but a separate 144,000. That might be possible as well. Though in my studies, I believe it's two sets of 12,000. 12,000 under the Moses type, 12,000 under the Elijah type. So you've got the Elijah company and the Moses company. We've explained that before. And that begins the 40 days and the persecution will really come strong against them. And that's why when we see in Luke chapter 21, we see this persecution coming against them right away. Remember, they're the Elijah company, okay? And this persecution is going to begin really quick. See, in verse 12, Luke 21, verse 12, this is all part of that 40, 50-day period, the above portion. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute, delivering you up into synagogues and into prisons just like it says in smyrna they're gonna be delivered into prisons being brought before kings and rulers it'll turn to you for a testimony and then what does it say it says uh and some of you they shall cause to be put to death the exact same thing it talks about in smyrna you don't see this same conversation in mark or in matthew okay this is what it's and look at what it says and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends this conversation carries through into Mark, but then you don't see it in Matthew because the Elijah company's time will be done at the end of seals. You're going to see that, and you're going to understand why I'm bringing this, uh, why I'm bringing this into the, the teaching as well. So what do we see with this? The persecutions will begin even in the midst of those 40 days. It's the exact same thing that we're reading about here in Luke that when we go to Revelation chapter 2 and we go to Smyrna, that's what we just saw. I know your tribulation, your poverty, the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. See? And some of them put to death. And I will give thee crown of, the crown of life. You see, it's the same conversation. They are the Smyrna group, that remnant Luke portion of people. And then what happens? Well, then it's Pergamum. <clears throat> Remember what happens in Pergamum? Watch this. You're going to see this in the in the seven churches of prophecy in in the intro series. Then we see in Pergamum. I know where Satan's seat is. It's the time of martyrs. We see Balaam and Balak there. So you got Balaam and Balak. It's a time of martyrs. And look what he's going to do. He says, and I will give thee of the hidden manna. Why are they going to be given of the hidden manna? Because the time of Pergamum is at the end of World War III, at about two and a half years into tribulation, that the beast, Antichrist, is going to show up on the scene. It's the time of fleeing into the wilderness. This fleeing into the wilderness, by the way, this fleeing into the wilderness is the wilderness, as you guys know that have been around for a while, you know it obviously very well, is the fleeing of the wilderness of Mark's discourse. Mark's discourse is the seals. It's the abomination of desolation. This is not about the temple being rebuilt. This is about the Moses temple. The Moses temple that was in the wilderness was a temple covered in skin and it was portable. What are you? What are the saints in the midst of tribulation? It's still the Gentile age till the end of seals, which means the temple is still within them. They are a portable temple covered in skin. And this, this desolation being placed where it ought not 
excuse me, is talking about the mark of the beast. This is when they're going to flee into the wilderness of Pergamum. And Pergamum, as I just showed you in Revelation chapter 2, said that Balaam and Balak were the connection. Well, Balaam and Balak represent the beast and the false prophet. And what's the connection to it in the Old Testament? The period of the wilderness. Well, if we go to Numbers, check this out. <clears throat> we go to Numbers, I think, 24. There's Balaam. Balaam and Balak. The conversation of Balaam and Balak and what will come upon them that's connected to the beast and the false prophet at the end of days. I'm not going to go through it all because that's all in the teaching. This is when the Antichrist, when the beast gets power and authority to continue for 42 months, meaning he was here in the earlier part of seals, but this is when he gets the authority to really now take over. People would say the one world government, the new world order, <clears throat> you know, the one world religion, all of that stuff. So something powerful is going to happen during this mid seals that will cause the whole world that will cause the whole world to want to suddenly fall under this guy's authority. And that's what we're going to lead into in the next part of the teaching. So the question is, is it going to be what I'm going to be talking about? Or is it just going to be as it was historically in connection to the time of Moses? Okay? With Moses, what were we talking about? This is the Mark discourse fleeing into the wilderness. It's about the mark of the beast. We know the beast is Arab. We know it relates to the mark of the, of the uh, not only Arab, but the, the mark of the Muslims. We know it's going to be their time of taking over. We've shown that, that uh, the raven relates to Arab. We know that the attack that destroys Jerusalem is from the Arab. And we know that it's the Muslims that are going to now have their portion through the enemy. So, you're going to see what I'm getting at when we go further into this. Because is this going to be the time of, of a man and the people with him? Or is it going to be something much crazier? I don't believe, we'll get to it, but I don't believe it's going to be something much crazier. I believe something much crazier will be seen. But I don't think that much crazier will be yet on the earth. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? Because it's the mark of the beast and this is the relation to the mark with buying and selling. And the reason so many people are going to be willing to take it is because of all the famine and death and destruction that they saw over the first two and a half years take place. Because World War III will be the whole world. And when they're all on their knees, just gasping and dying, the beast will stand up with his power and authority from Satan. And the world will have been crying out for a savior. And that's how he's going to fool the majority of the world. Look what happens next. We get to Thyatira. So we just saw how it was connected to Balaam and Balak. <clears throat> then what, what's going to happen to Balaam and Balak? Well, Numbers 24, 17 says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Remember, everybody's talking about this star of Jacob going on right now. Everybody thinks it's going to go supernova, even though it's about two years short of, of that 80-year time frame. But they believe there's enough gases and stuff built into it, and they call it the star, Jacob's star. And that Jacob's star is, is going to make this supernova explosion again. I say, nope. Jacob's star, the star and the scepter is the timing of what? When the Lord will destroy and deal with the beast and the false prophet, if you go to Revelation chapter 2, it's a picture of the end of the six years of seals. And what do we come to? We come to Thyatira. And Thyatira has who? That woman Jezebel there, who is trying to what? Seduce the servants who are the servants, the Smyrna group. 
that Luke group, that remnant group that was prepared to commit fornication and to eat, eat things sacrificed unto idols. <clears throat> Behold, I will give her, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. I will kill her children with death uh, and let the churches know. Now look at what it says. Verse 27, this is when he's now coming. At the end of the sixth year of seals, which if it starts from the 40 days, this would be what, brothers and sisters? This would be him coming then at the timing of October 31st in six years from this year, which would be Mark's portion, which is the what? The, the after six days, which is the after six years that if it begins from the start of his 40 days and that's the end, that means it would start his 40 days on October 31st and it would end the six years at the timing of October 31st to November 1st. Now, why is that a big deal? Because booties and the description with the star, which is Arcturus, and listen to what it says. In verse 27, Revelation 2, the end of the sixth year, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Arctur uh, booties has a rod, right? With a rod of iron and a vessel, uh, as the vessels of potter shall he be, shall they be, sorry, broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, I will give him the morning star. The morning star was just described, you know, the star of Jacob that everybody's talking about. This is when he's going to beat and defeat after the 42 months. He's going to defeat the beast and the false prophet. The false prophet will be able to just go away, but the beast is going to be thrown into hell. Not the lake of fire, but into hell. He'll be defeated and be gone for the seventh year of seals and for the first half of trumpets. So look at what we're seeing here. He's coming with a rod. He's the star. We have the star, whether it's the star of Jacob is that that star, that that supernova that will go, which would then be in, in six years, not this year. And or it's Arcturus. And Arcturus is mentioned in Scripture, not some supernova star of David, but Arcturus is mentioned. And Arcturus is in booties. And booties is October 31st. When the time of that star in booties, Arcturus moves as the sun in the same place, <clears throat> but is in its position. And where is he coming from? He's coming from the north because that star is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. And where is paradise coming from? The north. The Lord is coming with paradise from the north. So here comes the Lord. <clears throat> here is the end. Remember I said from this line, 40 days start here. The end of six is right here. So it's the end of Thyatira. There he is seen coming. And then what is it? It's the time of Sardis. So that that last day starts. So from the 31st of, of October to November 1st is the time of the end of Thyatira. Like we saw the description of him coming, which description sounds a lot like Revelation chapter 12. We go to Revelation chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So the child coming to rule all nations with a rod of iron is coming as the morning star. It's coming as that star. And then what are you going to have? And her child was caught up. What is this was caught up? This was caught up is the great multitude rapture in that seventh year. When he has come after the sixth, in the midst of that seventh year, is going to be <clears throat> the great multitude rapture called was caught up. The first one is like a rapture, like a caught up. This is the pre-trib going to the third heaven. The other one is the group such and one a man. Okay? Kind of like the first one. But not those who were in Christ's spirit filled that went first. But these were the ones that were left behind. These were the saints, the church. <clears throat> and what happens? They're going to be the ones who are was caught up. This is when he's coming with Mount Zion from the north, which is paradise. And he's what? That is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. And he's the one coming from the north. <clears throat> and he's coming for the rapture group. Well, remember, they are called the saints. <clears throat> we can show this in a number of places. Remember the last chapter of Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians? 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, how it starts. Now concerning the collection for the saints. Remember what we broke this down, what it meant prophetically? You see, now concerning the collection for the saints. If we go to Revelation 13, Revelation 13, this conversation about the saints. Look at what it says. <clears throat> Those that are going to have to endure, right? Revelation 13, 7. This is at mid-seals time, right? That about two and a half years when the beast gets his power. What's going to happen? He's going to be able to have power over the saints. And it says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred, tongue, and nations. <coughs> uh, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So when is he coming to collect the saints? At the end of the sixth year. If the start of the six years was from the start of the 40 days at the White Horse Rider Smyrna, and it's October 31st, and he's coming at the end of six being the timing of October 31st to uh, November 1st. Well, look at what it equals prophetically in the books. I just showed you the end of Thyatira as a picture of him coming at that timing of the end of the sixth year of seals. And then what does it say? Sardis, which in the is of the age since Christ, is a reflection, excuse me, is a reflection, is a typology of the church of the Reformation. The Reformation. And the Reformation took place what? October 31st? Do you understand that this book with this was put together and done in 2020? That the seven churches we revealed before that, but we've added even greater detail as, as more revelation came. We didn't change detail. We added great, greater and greater insight to what we already knew about it playing out over the 50 days and 14 years. Do you know that this wasn't even made by this ministry? It was made by another group decades ago. And when I saw it, the book of Revelation and the seven churches of the end completely clicked. And what played out over 2,500 years and over 2,000 years will play out over 50 days and 14 years. That's why Mark's discourse says in the midst of it, It'll be a time worse ever up to this time since the creation. And then Matthew's, which is down here, the second half of Trumpets, says it'll be even worse than it ever was at any point to this point. And then we'll never be worse after this. Because all of the craziness that played out over 2,500 and 2,000 years will be condensed into the most wild 14 years and 50 days in the entirety of all human history. And Sardis, the end of six, at that connection of the coming of the Lord after six days, is connected to the Reformation in the is, and in the was, is connected to the time of Israel's kings. And when Christ comes, what is he going to be? He's going to be the high priest and king Melchizedek. He's going to be the king of Israel. Not the land. The people, the church, who are what? The saints. And what? when is he coming at this point? He's coming at the time that we've talked about for years. Is the timing of the Reformation. <clears throat> and the Reformation was October 31st. And the 14 years, if the six years begin at the 40, at the time of the Reformation, but not the Reformation being for us, but after six years, and its connection is the Reformation, it equals the same date. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get crazy. I get so, because I just can't believe we understand what we understand. These connections, this revelation, it's been, it's been like this for seven years. And somehow I can retain it all in my head. It's, it's crazy. It's absurd. Seven and a half years ago, 
I didn't even read my King James. I was so confused with the thou, these, that. I was just, ah, forget it. I would just listen to prophecy teachers, some of the big ones, and I would make occasional little notes at certain verses they mentioned. That was the extent of what I did. And then, boom, the Spirit entered and said, time for you to get to work. And as you guys know, my life changed, and it's never been the same since. And I wouldn't change it for all the money in the world. I wouldn't change it for anything. It is absolutely astonishing. Well, do you guys know that the after six years, him coming is the time of reformation, which would be Revelation 12.5, which would be Revelation chapter 2, the end of Thyatira to the start of Revelation 3 with Sardis. It would be the this chapters the, the the seven churches revelation of the timing of the reformation from the is and the time of Israel's kings in the was when Christ is coming to rule as high priest and king because he's going to be what he's going to be as Joshua he's going to be high priest and king well when he comes when he comes at this line at this dividing point and it's the time of reformation of october 31st if it is that count from the beginning of 40 to the end of six and he is the high priest and king what did it say would come at this point well then would it not be the time of the saints the time of the great multitude rapture the time of the collecting of the saints for the was caught up for those of the was caught up going to paradise <laughs> well let me tie this in a bit more for you again when he's coming with the rod in his hand at the time of booties again at arcturus the star with a sickle in his hand so there's a star like the morning star because it's rising on october 31st and setting and rising at the exact same time and place as the sun it's the only one that does it and it's the star from the north the only the brightest star in the northern constellations and he's coming with his sickle and when he comes for that sickle he's coming as revelation 14 verse 14 when he's coming what to bring in that harvest to reap that harvest He's the one coming with the sickle in his hand. Well, brothers and sisters, do you know in the church what November 1st is after Reformation Day? <laughs> Some of you guys do. You guys told me. I forgot about it. Do you know what November 1st is? All Saints Day. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my do you see what i'm talking about when i say all of the connections that are here to be at the timing of the end of the 70th year to to be in john in john 7 into john 8 in genesis 7 into genesis 8 to be in psalms 18 to psalms 19 to be in the sun moon and stars to be in the two places where it talks about booty and booties connected to the time of the constellation of booties. And it's the time of the Reformation equaling six years later. And the day after the Reformation is called All Saints Day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My head's about to explode. Let me have a sip of coffee. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's so wild all saints day for those of you who have been around for a while i i taught on this man five almost six years ago with the end of romans the last chapter of romans is a picture of the pre-trib and a group that remains the last chapter of romans chapter uh, uh first corinthians sorry sorry last chapter of romans is a picture of a remnant group that remain and the pre-trib group that's gone at the end in first corinthians it's a picture of the rapture group coming in, which is talking about the collection of the saints. And it's talking then of another group who are going to serve the Lord, which relates to the 144 that you see in Revelation chapter 7. And then it talks about the group Priscilla and Aquila, who represented the first worker group from Romans 16, who put their necks on the line. And now they're gone. 
they salute you much in the Lord because they're giving greetings to this next worker group who's going out. And it starts with a conversation of this collection of the saints. You go to 2 Corinthians 13, which is a picture of the Lord coming at the end. And remember we said there's a pre-trib, a mid-trib, and a post-trib. Well, look at what we see here. This is the third time I'm coming to you. <laughs> I love it. That's that's one of my, I, I keep saying one of my favorites all the time. But man, it, it is one of my favorites. It's such a wild revelation from the last chapter of each. Even when I think back about how I was revealed, that, that understanding in the last chapter of each, I don't have an answer. I just, it just came to me. I saw something and I remembered reading something over here and I remembered reading and I just, all, I just went in to read it and boom, 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 boom. It just all connected and I saw it right away. Everything is a pre, mid, post. There's a worker chosen from the pre. There's a worker group of the 144 chosen from the mid. And then there's a worker group at the end of tribulation. And that worker group are from the 12 tribes. And they're the ones that work during the millennial reign. Not those that are resurrected who served in the first servant group. They're the ones who put their necks on the line, the, the, the Priscilla's and Aquila's, and they're going to be resurrected at the end to rule and reign with the Lord. But there's going to be a group from the tribes that are going to be working during the millennial reign to go and teach the world the ways of the Lord. But the Smyrna group, those who are going to be resurrected, remember what their reward is. Their reward is shown to us, for a little reminder, is shown to us at the end of Laodicea, which is the end of the timing, that time of the end of the 14th year. And it says, To him that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. That's the group that's going to be resurrected to serve with him that you see in Revelation chapter 20 that he started with by letting them know when he comes to knock on the door right before the 50 days in the pre-trib began. It's incredible. Isn't that wild? The exact timing to the count? If this is the start of the 40 days of the start of the six years, then this would be the end of it. And it starts at the time of the Reformation and it ends at the Reformation, but the Reformation isn't for the pre-trib, it's for the mid-trib, and it's followed by the collection of the saints at All Saints Day? He's there with his sickle, just as booties is for the sickle. <laughs> it's so absolutely incredible. It just blows me away. What a wild first couple hours we've had, bros, brothers and sisters, bros, <laughs> brothers and sisters. It's just been awesome. Remember this with Arcturus? This is that star in booties. And Arcturus is, by the way, as I said, is mentioned in the Bible. It's the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Look at this. And the brightest in the northern celestial hemisphere. So if the Lord is from is in the north, if paradise, Mount Zion, heavenly Mount Zion, paradise, if he's coming with Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals, and he's coming from the north where paradise is, which we've talked about, and the brightest star representing or appearing to represent him within booties is Arcturus, and it's the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, well, that starts to make more sense, too, in the timing of everything. Because if you recall from Psalms 48, right, when we talked about this, when we're, as, we, as we start to go in this next section, because listen to what this says. <clears throat> Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. Mount Zion, brothers, when he comes with heavenly Mount Zion, when he's coming with the mountain of the Lord, it is paradise that he's coming with. And where is he coming from? Is Mount The whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. The sides of the north, well, we talked about that, right? This stuff, in relation to the North Pole and its connection to what researches and different things have gone on, that it would appear it's in the North Pole. And what does it mean? Right? What, what does this mean? Well, this is something that we were talking about in the past that we're leading into now 
when we come into Zechariah chapter 8, which is a picture of the first year of trumpet judgments, the Lord was now here at the end of the sixth. So he was here during the seventh year. And some things happened during the seventh year, right? We're going to talk about those. But when the seventh year is done and the Lord is here, now the city and streets and the temple will be built. The actual physical temple is going to get built. It's not being built by the Antichrist. The Lord is going to be here on Mount Zion, on paradise. This is why he said in John 14, and if you go chapters to years like we've been just so excited about from 7 into 8 now, if you go to chapter 14, it represents the seventh year of seals for which the Lord told them. The timing in the chapters to years is exact. Listen to what he said. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming at the end of six. And in that seventh year, he's going to collect the saints. That great multitude was caught up, rapture group, going to paradise. And paradise is Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord that is coming from the north, connected to the time of booties, the man with the sickle and his rod with a star that is rising as the sun and setting as the sun on that date from the same place. <clears throat> and so after that seventh year of seals, it's the beginning of trumpet judgments and it starts. The Lord is there on Mount Zion, right? Look at what Zechariah 8 says. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was, meaning he was jealous for them before. We read that in chapter one of Zechariah before, and we'll see it in other places. He was jealous, but now he's at this, he's come on heavenly Mount Zion. The world was freaking out. You see that at the end of the, you see that at the end of the uh, 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 sixth year of seals, the world is freaking out. It was the day of the Lord, the, the great day of the Lord. And it says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And then he's going to gather them there. Some of the ones like the, the ancient Hebrews, right? The Israelites, he's going to gather them there. And they're going to rebuild on the foundation, of course, that was laid during seals. And he says, now they're going to start to rebuild the temple. And he says, because before these days, you couldn't do it because peace was taken. That's the red horse rider. To him that went out, it came in because of the affliction. For I said, everyone against his neighbor. That's the red horse rider. So until the end of the seven years of seals, till they're done, it's going to be affliction and tribulation and neighbor against neighbor. Okay, that's the tribulation of seals. <clears throat> now, he settles all these things. They're going to be rebuilding. But where is it? my point in all this is he's now there on Mount Zion. And Mount Zion, we were told, came from the north. The star that is there from Arcturus and Booties, who is the, the, the sheep herder, the owner of the flock. He's now got... His, 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 uh, his sickle for the harvest that's coming, which is another way of saying the flock that was prepared, which is another way of saying for the, 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 the uh, 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 saints. He's coming for the saints. He's coming for that wheat harvest. He's coming for, for the, the sheep. You see? And who were the ones that got them to that point? In this greatest revival in human history, in the midst of all of this greatest chaos to this point, it was the apostles and the disciples. The apostles were out doing their work, but it was the, the disciples really going throughout the earth, and they are that remnant prepared for the time of the end. They are that Elijah-type company. That's them. Then what happens? Well, now you have to remember, we're going to go into... A video here from uh, Deep Believer that was shared from, oh, what's his name? Do they have his name here? Yeah, L.A. Marzulli. And we're going to see this in a moment. We're just going to watch, I think, a couple or so minutes here and there. 
But what I want you to remember is that the whole world, as I told you earlier, the whole world of prophecy believes the end of days is only seven years. So when they're talking about what we're going into next, because what I was leading you into is a conversation we had not too long ago about what it's going to look like at the end of the sixth year of seals. Remember what I was talking about here earlier in Pergamum and, and what might possibly be, but most likely not? But what do we know about the Lord coming at the timing of the end of seals? I mean, we got this timing, which seems pretty smack dab on now. And in the timing of years, it's smack dab on. But what do we know is coming? Well, we know that the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals is coming on Mount Zion with the mountain of the Lord from the north, the holy mountain. And look at what it says. Everybody is going to be freaking out. They're going to be seeing something coming that is going to cause them such panic that the rich and the poor, the free and the bond are going to run into the dens of the rocks and into the mountains and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. This is the wrath of the Lamb, okay? The great day of the Son, okay, of the Lord is coming. Not of the Father, but of the Son. And what are they seeing coming? They're going to be in such a panic because they're going to be seeing something coming from above. From above. Something from above. But you see, the world has been taught in seven-year tribulation that everybody or most will go pre-trib and then it's seven years of Jacob's trouble which will begin with a rebuilding of the temple and then the beast having built the temple will go into it and proclaim himself as as Lord you see you can understand now how that is completely like I said earlier twisting it into a, a whole concoction of knots together because they see these things in Scripture, but because they only see from a seven-year Matthew perspective, they crush it all into one and twist it all up because at no point in history did anybody but the Lord direct his chosen people to build that temple. At no point did the enemy ever build the temple of the Lord. Ever. Not our bodies. He's corrupted it, but he didn't build it. The Lord did. Same with the other temples, the physical temples, right? It was built. It wasn't built by, by uh, the Egyptians. It wasn't built by the enemy, but they came in and corrupted it later. It's the same thing here. These are the events of seals that we talked about. And at the end of seals, most people's thinking is as it's as if they're at the end of seals. They think in the terms of People are going pre-trib, if they believe in pre-trib, they're believing that pre-trib is going to happen, that the 144,000 are going to go out, that the rebuilding of the temple is going to take place and it's going to be done by the Antichrist, and then the Antichrist is going to go in and declare himself God after having rebuilt it. That's, you see how they've twisted and smashed seals and trumpets together with these groups. Because what they haven't understood is the 14 years and, of course, the Gospels in their revelation and what they reveal. Hence, there's no way you could understand the timing of the seven churches. So what happens is at the end of the six years of seals, we know that the Lord is coming on this mountain-looking paradise place that's coming from the north at the timing of the Reformation and All Saints Day to put the sickle in and or you could say to gather the sheep from the shepherds who watched over them, who healed them, who led them, who protected them. You see, 
And now as the owner, he's coming to collect them. He's coming for his harvest. We know that that harvest doesn't begin right away. As I explained to you in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, they will have seen him come. But they don't get to go right away. And that's because though the harvest happens at the time of the fall feast, like we're in at the, at the fall season, we'll say, and it's going to be at, apparently at that October 31st, November 1st time frame in six years from now to start the seventh year, we know it'll be about six, most likely seven months before it's observed after the battle and everything else. And it'll be seven months of cleaning up the bones and everything else, right? And then that great multitude will have come in. But he comes at the end of the sixth year, destroys the enemies, and then it's the time of the saints and the collecting of the saints. It seems like, are they all going to go at once? Do they, do they, does it take its time to get them there? Or, you know what I mean? But we know that they're going to paradise, and we know that he's coming on something that is going to panic and freak the world out. But the world, like I said, and I'll finish this point, in a seven-year thinking, they think it's the Antichrist coming first. They don't know it's the Lord coming. And in a seven-year thinking, what they think of the Antichrist, as I'm about to show you with L.A. Marzulli, is they think that the alien ship is coming down, or they go up, like the people go up as the, as the tribulation, the pre-trib, which they would call the pre-trib, and then the ships are coming. And that, that sh those ships, he believes, are the deception. You see, we've all told that there's a great deception coming. But many people believe it in a couple ways. They believe that it's something like a Project Blue Beam, and they're going to laser beam these images into the sky that it's going to look like aliens, but really it's not. Okay? That, that's so far conspiracy wrong, it it's, it's, makes no sense. It really doesn't when you understand as we've grown in this revelation. <clears throat> because we know the Lord is coming on something that is going to be a flying thing of some sort that is called a, a mountain carved without hand where it comes from. And it is going to panic the world when they see it coming. Well, the world in their seven-year thinking thinks as if they're at the end of seals. So when you're going to hear this conversation, you have to remember that his real thinking, even though he doesn't think the end of seals, he thinks the seven years. And so they're, they're thinking this ship is coming, a group is going, and this ship is coming. And that when these ships come, that's the deception, and it's going to be only the fallen angels. Well, that's part of the story. But at the end of seals, before the fallen angels really come, and we're going to talk about that, the Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion going to look like when it's going to be made visible to the whole earth coming? It's going to look like some wild, maybe mountain-looking or just massive ship, place, where the great multitude rapture are going to be taken in. The Lord is in the north on Mount Zion. We talked about this. So the world of, of the great deception is thinking it's going to be like Project Bluebeam. That could be further from the truth. But the rest of the people, the majority, and I used to fit in this, is that the, that the aliens, quote unquote, that are out there aren't really the, the, the lie we've been told about aliens, but they're really the fallen angels. Uh-uh, that's only part of the story. There's the good angels, and there's the fallen angels. And they all have their ships. Yep. We talked about that not too long ago, right? What is the Lord going to be coming on at that point? What is it going to look like? It's going to look like this massive mountain, or what? Or what is it, from a mountain? Like it's coming out of a mountain? Because the world is going to see it coming from above and they're going to be freaking out. We know what it means now. 
And how did we know what this means? <clears throat> you see, the world is going to think that the deception is only this alien thing and that they're all bad guys. L.A. Marzulli, myself, many others, and L.A. Marzulli believes that, but myself, I used to believe that. But we now have biblical evidence that the good guys have ships and the bad guys have ships. And I'm going to show it to you even more today. And I'm going to show you some of his thinking and what he talks about. But I wanted you to know that most people think, or almost the whole world outside of us, thinks it's only seven years long. And in the seven years, where they're really thinking is the end of seals. So when people see this coming at the end of seals, they're going to think it's what? A great deception. They're going to think that the great deception isn't the Antichrist, but that the great deception is what they're seeing coming, and they're going to be freaking out. But the remnant workers will know who it is. The remnant workers will be prepared because they knew in advance. And so what do you think they'll be able to help teach and explain to those who are fleeing into the wilderness and that they're helping and that they're leading and that they're saving and doing all these things? They're going to help them to understand that at the end of that six years, what they're going to see coming isn't some sort of alien deception, but that it's the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion that's coming in his day. You see, the deception is that we've been told aliens are what we've been told aliens are. The truth is that there are the fallen angels and the good angels. And that they all have their ships. It has nothing to do with, with this alien deception that we've been told. But because people haven't understood this, and L.A. Marzulli talks about it, about, you know, the church not ready for this, the church not prepared for it. And the reason why is because of the deception of what we've been told aliens are. That it's just some extraterrestrial, other dimensional, or, or other uh, uh, um, uh, galaxy beings, and there's got to be some out there. And that's been the deception. And what most Christians in prophecy have understood that, this, that the deception is really fallen angels. That they're not really aliens, but they're the fallen angels. The problem with that is they've only got half the story. And if you believe that they're only the fallen angels, then what do you think they're going to believe at the end of the six year of seals when the Lord's coming on Mount Zion? They're going to think that's the great deception. When it's not. Because you're going to see the Lord has his own ships. Yep. And we're going to see what he talks about with even Ezekiel. And we've talked about Ezekiel before. And we're going to point to it. I mean, sorry, not Ezekiel, with uh, Elijah. And we're going to point to it again because remember, this remnant group of people are a picture of Elijah. And those who are alive at the end when the Lord comes are going to go as Elijah went. So when he talks about the going and then these aliens, the, these saucers are coming. No, these saucers are coming at the end of the sixth year. Or this great mountain-like looking one is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And then the Elijah company goes, and then there will be the great multitude as well that will follow shortly after. But in the deception of the great deception, the world thinks it's aliens, and prophecy people think it's only fallen angels. And so when it comes, the world will think aliens and the church that has understood some of these things will think it's the great deception of the fallen angels. But the remnant prepared workers will know that there are both. And we know the one coming at the end of the sixth year is the Lord on Mount Zion having come from the north. And he's coming with his ships. And I'm going to prove it to you. Let's see what Eli Marzulli has to say here. Not long, just a couple minutes here and there. So let's have a listen to this. And how big were those craft? They're huge. Mile wide. Yeah. This is, this is what's coming. And, and, and the people in the church, they don't get it. And it's not my problem that they don't get it. Okay, I, I've done my work. That's why this book. 
because I talk about what the, what the last rung is, where it's going. And this is where we are. The book of Revelation tells us that there'll be a one world government and a one world religious system. How do you do that? How do you do that, Jennifer? Oh, that's just allegory, LA. It's really never going to happen. Oh, really? Yeah, you want to make a bet? When these guys show up, they will tell us that they created all life on this planet. They genetically manipulated early man. They started the world's civilizations. Now at this critical juncture, they are back. Oh, they started the world's religions too. So they genetically manipulated early man. They started this first civilization, started the world's religions. Now at this critical juncture in human history, they are back to usher mankind into a golden age. I heard this 50 years ago. We've come full circle to when I was in the new age, that when the space brothers would come, some people wouldn't, wouldn't be ready for the paradigm shift. And the space brothers would take these people to another place so they could evolve. I heard it 50 years ago before I was a Christian. That explains Okay, so you heard that right there, <clears throat> this timing of what he's talking about, because he believes they're only, he's only talking about them as fallen angels. And most of the church does not understand it, and some of the church does, but they don't understand the other part, which is what I was just talking about. You see, in a seven-year thinking, they're only looking to the Jacob's trouble understanding. And they think that in Matthew 24, at the, at the abomination of desolation, that that's the timing most likely that that takes place. Well, they're right. That is the timing. But it's not the timing that L.A. Marzulli is trying to, is trying to connect it to. He's trying to connect it to, to this time in the beginning that, that uh, um, one world government and one world religion. Is this when they're coming and, he's gonna, and they're going to make it known? Well, we're going to go through that. We're going to see if we can assess that and see if that's indeed what's coming. See if that is indeed true. Because that would mean it would have to come during seals and not at trumpets. Or is it coming only at mid-trumpets and having, you know, fought off the Lord, if you will. Remember the, the, the cutoff and stuff that happens. And then they will claim it then at that point. Well, we're going to have a look into that. Let's listen to the rest of this. It's the rapture. And then... Oh, wait, 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 hold on. Okay, so you said that explains the rapture. So could you emphasize on that just a little bit more so they understand it? Because I was just going to ask go up, you. Uh -huh. We go up. Okay, this is in the very last chapter of the book. So I'm kind of giving away the farm here. So folks, you got to promise me you're going to buy the book. It's good. Because you, I, I have an hour, a little over an hour with Jennifer. But I'll tell you this. When Elijah the prophet goes up, Elisha sees him go up. When Jesus ascends to heaven, the apostles are there. I believe the two Marys, Mary Magdalene, Mary, his mother, they're there. How many ever disciples and followers? 500, 100, who knows? The Bible doesn't tell us. They watch him do what? Ascend where? Into the clouds. So you heard him talk about Elijah. Okay? They're talking about Elijah. We know. We've talked about this stuff with Elijah, haven't we? Elijah, we're told, and we're going to go into it again a little bit, we're told that the, a chariot is defined as an upper millstone. And this is an upper millstone. This is a millstone, okay? You can see a millstone and the grinding for a millstone. This is the upper part of a millstone. Elijah was taken in a chariot that's described as an upper millstone. So it becomes crystal clear when you understand this and you track it in relation to the deception that's coming. But if Elijah was taken in one of these called an upper millstone, called a chariot, then how could they all be bad? You see? And L.A. Marzulli is going in and talking about the, the connection to the rapture. We go up, they come down. No. No, because you see, he's connecting the rapture to when everybody's going and he thinks it's pre-trib. But when you're studying from Matthew and you only understand 77 years, you're really at the end of seals at the great multitude rapture. And what has come down already first? Messiah on heavenly Mount Zion. Which is going to look like some wild mountain looking ship. He's coming with the place prepared. It's coming from the north. So that is coming. And then the great mid-trib multitude rapture happens. How prepared do you think the saints will be for that without a group of people understanding in advance? 
You see what I'm saying? A people being prepared, brothers and sisters. We're going to cover a little bit of this. So, yeah, tonight it looks like we still got a little time to go. It won't take too, too long, but we'll probably be a little over three hours. That's okay. I know some of you guys don't mind. Some of you, maybe you mind. Just take a break here. You could pause it and go back to when I start talking about this and come back later. Watch it in parts and pieces if you need to. Because I'm going to finish this one today because this is just, it's just on fire, man. It's so awesome. So now listen to this. Let's listen to this last uh, few seconds. Come down. And who is they? Right here. Fallen angels. This is the coming great deception. The coming great deception. This creates the one world government and the one world religious system. This is how you do it. Space Brothers. Once again, they will say we created all life on this planet. We genetically manipulated early man. We started the world civilizations. We started the world's religions. Now we're going to tell you who God really is. And by the way, can you see that? He's only associating it to the enemy. And do you know one of the number one reasons why? The Gospels that reveal the 14 years. Do you know why? Because they don't understand that the end of the sixth year of seals is the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion from the north, which is paradise. In whatever this is going to look like, they don't know that 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 he's coming. They don't know that it's him here with the modern day uh, Zerubbabel that will be in Jerusalem ruling as Zechariah 8 says, when the city and the streets and the temple will then get rebuilt while they're there. It's impossible for that to be understood in anybody's seven-year thinking, which is why it's the we go up or we've taken them away and these space brothers are really just the fallen. No, it's got to be both, and that's what we've proven. Now what I want to show you is let's see if we can understand this timing. Of course, we know this one, but what about what comes earlier? This one is clear. We talked about it a couple or a few months ago, maybe a couple months ago. And we were just talking about this timing of this is pretty darn clear. We've understood that now. He's coming from the north. It's going to look like this crazy mountain looking ship type thing. The place prepared and it will be established above Jerusalem. It's going to be wild. <laughs> just imagine that. If the people, if the saints weren't prepared for what was coming. Doesn't it make sense that the remnant prepared for the time of the end would know this in advance? So that they could prepare the saints. So where else outside of this timing of of the Lord coming? What about other places? There might be these things taking place. You see, this is what I was talking to you guys about earlier in relation to the timing of Pergamum. Because Pergamum, Constantine, a picture of the Antichrist, the beast, the, the Mark's discourse fleeing into the wilderness at the time of the Mark of the beast. Could this be? Because you see what L.A. is talking about, even though he doesn't understand the association of the timing, he's really talking about down here, which is true. But it's not we go up and they come down. It's not going to be for another about three and a half, four years from from the seventh year of seals till mid trumpets. So that's that's not it at all. So the confusion of the timing is very off. But where he's associating it is really this time that's connected to Pergamum, because Pergamum is the time of the new world order. This is when the beast gets his authority and and the one world religion and the false prophet and so forth. This is that timing. We saw that with Balaam and Balak. So in, in understanding this timing with Balaam and Balak, we also understand that it's connected to the timing of the wilderness, which is associated with the time of Moses. Remember, this is the time of the mark of the beast on the portable temple of skins. Like Moses, when they had fled into the wilderness, they were fleeing from Pharaoh, right? So we've seen this throughout throughout history is this, this Constantine type, the, the Pharaoh type. These, these were men 
that were going after them, and it was this fleeing into the wilderness. And the one with Moses is the one that is the representation of this one. So is it really going to be uh, uh, some sort of alien visitation? I'm not convinced. It is, but I'm going to show you a couple points that maybe we could be aware of. Because this point here, in historically, again, we know is connected to the mark of the beast. We know is connected to what? The time of the Arabs. We know that there are seven kings, right? And then the, the eighth is of the seventh. We know it relates to the beast. We know, we know what happens. We know it's connected to the, the, the kingdoms. So all of the wording prophetically does not lead me to believe that at the middish two and a half years or so into seals, that it's going to be the alien deception at the time of the one world religion, new world order, all of that. What causes people to fall for it is the fact that there's been two and a half years, as, as, as I said earlier, that there's been two and a half years <coughs> of millions who have vanished, chaos erupting all over the earth from it. Uh, world War III breaks out, and there's two and a half years of World War III and absolute devastation and, 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 and chaos that people will be brought to their knees in famine, in death, that people will just be on their knees calling out to anybody to save them. <coughs> and that is how the, the beast, the, the Antichrist, will, will have that power where people will turn to him because the world will cry out for anybody at this point to save them. Those who are Christ, those who are part of the saints, will have recognized and called out to Christ in the midst of this. Hence, the reason for the apostolic age and the greatest revival that will be in the midst of the greatest chaos. But the rest of the world <clears throat> will be crying out for anybody and will fall for somebody who's really there, which will be the beast, the Antichrist, with the false prophet who's with them to show these miracles and these wonders to say, this is the guy. <clears throat> you see? So I don't think there's a need for or a, 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 a a point of these of the the alien type of the enemies of the fallen to come at this point so we can understand that through so much of prophecy and we can do that by going in revelation 12 going in 13 but here's what's really interesting on the other side of it you see we're going to see something here in revelation 12 that leads us to think maybe something will be seen because even Revelation 12.1, Revelation 12.1 on its own is definitely something at the time of the pre-trib, just after it, that it's going to be seen. What is this that's going to be seen? What is this great wonder uh, in Virgo? I don't know. But look at, at the definition of the word appeared. We've talked about it many times. For seven years, we've talked about it. It says, to gaze, that is, with eyes wide open at something remarkable and thus differing from simply voluntary observation or merely passive mechanical casual vision. Okay? This is meaning to look at something with eyes wide open like, oh, that's how crazy this is going to be. But this is coming from Virgo, the representation of the mother, right? Of the virgin. So I don't see this being as, as the, the enemy that's coming. I've, as I've said before, <clears throat> I believe this is what we're going to see in relation to coming from that direction, which is during the seven days, as we've talked about, before the 40 days of the Son of Man, which means this will represent that seven-day period, which is the final seven days of the sun in Virgo. And it culminates at the end of Virgo, at the end of the foot of Virgo with the sun, at booties. You guessed it. At booties, at the Star of Turis, when the son of man comes to begin his 40 days. So this is going to be something seen 
that's going to have the world in a panic. Because as we said before, this is the connection to Luke chapter 21, right? This is Luke chapter 21, verse 25 through 28. You guys know this very well. And there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, Virgo. Uh, and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. Remember, at this time, the things are going to start to get chaotic. And men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Arriving, influencing. You can say attack, right? But no, not because of enemies, but because of we know the stone's throw is coming. This meteor, maybe it breaks up and so forth, right? So people are going to be in a panic. But we know as we start to see these things, the remnant group prepared to serve the Lord, waiting when he returns from the wedding, when they see these things coming, we're to look up and we're going to see them. And our redemption will be at hand and will be in his presence, receive the authority and, and have the meal with him and all these things. Our understanding will be opened. We'll be with him for 40 days. Then at the end of 50, or at the 50th day, receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, go out from Jerusalem, bang, Jerusalem is attacked, and the red horse rider starts. So do I think that this is the connection to something alien-esque coming? <clears throat> no. But then what do we have? Then we have the travailing. That's the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then we have the comma end, the word pained. This word pained is, as we've taught for years, it represents the first two and a half years of tribulation, which equals <clears throat> the, the time of World War III. And then what do we see? Then you get to verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Another sign appeared. And this word for appeared is the same one. Let's go back to Revelation 12. It's the same word for appeared. You see, there's going to be another sign at this time that is going to be something remarkable, looking out with eyes wide open where people are going to be in a what? What time is Revelation 12, 3? It's the time of fleeing into the wilderness from Mark's discourse. It's the time of Revelation 13. <coughs> it's the time of Revelation 13 when the beast rises up of the sea, seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his, uh, upon his, uh, sorry, ten crowns upon his horns. Uh, verse 2, and the beast which you saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were like unto a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And, listen to this, the dragon gave him his power and seat and authority. The dragon gives it to him. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto him? Who can make war with him? Okay, that time at the end of World War III to, to bring in this new world order that's coming. And it says, And there was given unto him about blasphemies, and look what? To continue 42 months. Who gave him his power and authority? The dragon. The dragon and he's getting that power and authority to continue for 42 months <coughs> and we see in verse 3 of revelation 12 when there appeared another wonder in heaven and it was the great red dragon is this is this the timing at that middish seals when the beast gets his power and they flee into the wilderness he's getting his authority from the great red dragon is this the time when there might be these quote-unquote aliens, the, the bad guys coming? <clears throat> well, maybe. But do I think they're coming onto the earth at this point? Is that really what's happening? Or is it a something that's definitely going to be seen, but is it a wonder in heaven? You see? not yet on the earth it is a wonder in heaven it is a wonder of something seen above so 
it's obviously going to be something that they're going to gaze on with eyes wide open at like, whoa, what is that? And could that be <clears throat> some of the fallen angels, ships maybe going about that are going to suddenly start to be seen through the veil? Maybe that's what we're seeing, right? But it doesn't mean they're on the earth. But it would appear that somehow he gets authority either, either through Satan through it or that what? That the great red dragon is again China. But if it's the great red dragon in China, what does it have to do with the wonder in heaven, which is a great wonder, which was also like one that happened at the beginning in Virgo? It would seem like whatever is going to come and is going to be seen at this point is in heaven and not yet coming to the earth. And it looks like maybe it'll be seen here and there, coming back and forth, whatever the case may be, during the second half of seals to the end of the sixth year of seals. Because then we see in verse 4, And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to deliver her child as soon as it was born, and she brought forth a man-child. Here's the son of man coming, and then here's the saints being caught up. This is the end, of course, of Luke's discourse. This is when, this is uh, the end of the sixth year of seals. This is the end of Mark's discourse when the Son of Man is seen coming. Okay, this is the end of Revelation chapter 2, going to the start of Revelation 3. This is when he's coming as a star with the rod in his hand. We know the timing now is, is uh, 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 the Reformation, the collection of the saints. So, is it possible that something is coming during the middish portion to the latter portion of seals that is going to be dealing with these fallen angels and ships? Quote unquote aliens. It might, but it seems more so that it is something seen above and not yet come to the earth. Just like this. What about this woman that appeared? What about this, this great wonder, I should say, in Revelation 12.1? Could this be something coming from Virgo, which we know the, the stones throw? But could it be the, the quote-unquote ship that takes the pre-trip? You see what I'm saying? I mean, these things, maybe that's what's seen pre- Maybe that's what's seen mid. But in relation to what he was talking about and saying that the New World Order and all that, what would get people to convert and to realize it, this would be that connection in Revelation 12, 3. You see? Where he's saying, well, they'll, they'll come down and they're going to say, we created you, we did all this, and you know we genetically modified and did all these things with you guys. This is where he's associating it. But I don't see that fully coming yet because this is something that is going to appear in heaven and not yet on the earth. You see, it's not until this point in relation to <clears throat> the seals where we see any chaos where people are freaking out. You see, we don't see this same type of freaking out outside of Revelation 12.1 from Luke chapter 21. When we come into the discord, I mean, when we come into the seals, <clears throat> we only see World War Three. We see uh, uh, famine coming, right? There's going to be a hunger. We're going to talk about that in a moment as well. This hunger, this famine, which is going to be a famine of food and water, but it's also going to be a famine for the word of God as well. Um, and then we see again the souls of those because those who are being beheaded and killed for the Lord. And then we get to the sixth seal, and we see, of course, this timing of, of uh, uh, the end of uh, Joel chapter 2. We see the stars of heaven falling into the earth, like casting an early fig tree. You know, So again, this is that connection to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And so, is this what's coming before Revelation 12, 5 as Revelation 12, 5? What is the, the falling of these stars? Is it the third of the angels, right? Some of those, some of the fallen angels, is this where they're coming now? 
Well, if it is, they're going to be defeated because we know when the Lord comes at the end of the six years of seals that it's going to be the Ezekiel 39 war. So what this strikes me more as is again like a like a meteor these that are coming. Okay? Like if we go to Mark 13 and the coming of the Lord, this this third of the stars being cast down, I'm not convinced that that these are again these fallen ones coming, right? But we see this at the coming of the Lord after that tribulation, which is the tribulation of the six years of seals. And it says, and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. You see, I, I, I'm not saying it can't be. But we're seeing from Revelation 12, 3, the dragon and then 12, 4 and 12, 4 is a picture of the sixth seal. And it's before the son of man then literally shows up. And then we have it over there in uh, uh, in Revelation 12, uh, uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 6. We have it in Mark chapter 13. The coming of the Son of Man, but the stars of heaven are going to fall. At casting an early fig tree, we're told it's a third of the stars that are cast down by the dragon. And then we got the coming of the Son of Man. Well, we know that the battle is going to be the Ezekiel 39 battle. And we know the nations that are involved, and it relates to the Muslim nations for all those that have came and attacked Jerusalem, which takes us back to the story of Zephaniah from that teaching a few months ago when Zephaniah chapter 2 says judgment on Judah's enemies because all those that came against are now going to be dealt with when he comes at the end of the sixth year. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. So, but, but we have this in, in the mix too. So is it going to be that these powers that are in heaven being shaken? Is it that it's like fig trees? I mean, maybe we're given a little bit more understanding because it's the stars of heaven that shall fall. In Revelation 12, 4, it's the, a third of the stars. But in Revelation 6, it's like being cast like an early fig tree. So is it fallen angels that are coming, representing like that third that fell? or is it actual like stones and, and this devastating stuff that's coming? I would still lean to it being a, a picture of the of the stars, meaning uh, uh, the devastation that's coming. All of the, the, the stars falling like uh, uh, like a, a, a fig tree being shaken. Like it says in Revelation chapter six, that is this fig tree being shaken and that's what's falling. So I'm not so sure that I would account it to still this yet being the, the enemy aliens coming at the time of seals. You see, because again, at this point, the people aren't freaking out because of that. They will have seen enough chaos by this point and enough freaky things by this point and devastation by this point that even though this is going to have them just saying, oh, no, not more. What is this? Where they really freak out is the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> you see? And that's what we're seeing here in Revelation 6. At that end of the sixth seal, the exact same time frame. They're not freaking out at the untimely fig trees that are shaking, which means this is going to come smashing onto the earth. What they're really freaking out about, you see, look, Every mountain and the islands are going to be moving out of their places because of this stuff coming flying to the earth and striking the earth. <laughs> you remember when I said it's going to be worse than it was in human history up to this point, and we're only in the second half of seals? You see? It's going to be chaos. And then look what they're going to see. Now they're going to all flee into the dens of the mountains and rocks and say, fall on us so that they can be hidden from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for it is the great day of his wrath. You see that? Now they're freaking out. If it was aliens prior to this, uh, as the fallen angel side of them, they would have been freaking out back here at the third of the stars, or the stars that are falling, or the, the, the stars that, uh, uh, like a fig tree, cast their early figs. You see? But they're not. 
what they're freaking out and hiding from is what they're seeing the Lord coming on. That's why they're freaking out. So I'm still not convinced, although I reserve the right to say maybe something is definitely going to be seen. Maybe something is coming towards the, the end of the sixth year. I don't believe it is yet the fallen angels. Because I, you need, we need to understand something. This is, like I was saying earlier, the connection to Moses. And we see this with Moses. It's still the temple of flesh. It's still the Muslims taking over their rule. You see, we know this through the Muslims, and we know it through their teachings and what their prophecies talk about, and that their time is coming what, in, during what we call the end of days. So I don't believe it's going to be alien uh, enemies at this point. Though there is going to be something seen in heaven that is probably going to be the alien ship, like his mountain ship, if you will. But I don't think it's coming to earth, but it will be seen. Does it stay there? Does it go? What does it do? What does it do? Uh, I don't know. But we saw that it's another wonder in looking up and people going, wow. But I'm not convinced they're coming yet. Because what we need to understand is the fallen angels, brothers and sisters, the demons, they are the nastiest creatures in existence, in spirit, and in, in, in manifesting in flesh. These guys are the worst. How on earth, if they showed up mid-seals, how on earth... Would the rest of them survive during the next 42 months? It'd be impossible. They're going to be eating people, guys. Yeah, we know that. We know how bad it's going to get. So remember, if that at this point here of mid-seals, that two and a half year mark after World War III, and the beast gets his power and authority from the dragon, that... It's still going to be a physical manifestation of humans on earth, but powered by the enemy. While the remnant workers of Smyrna and the apostles, they're going to be powered by the Lord and through the spirit. Hence, one bringing in the great multitude and the rest of the world falling for the enemy. So when we go to Mark's discourse and you read in Mark's discourse that it's going to be a time worse than ever up to this point, it's connected to this period right here. But when you get to Matthew's discourse and it talks about being a time worse than ever in human history and at this point forward will never be worse than this after, it's talking about the end, this time at the removal of Israel's kings. This is the end of Philadelphia, the mid-trumpets. At about 10 and a half years total into the 14 years, On this line here, when Messiah is cut off, Israel's king is cut off. We know about that. We've talked on it. We've studied it. It's mid-trumpets time. This is now when they flee into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle. Why? Because now Satan has been cast to the earth, having lost his battle in where? He wasn't having the battle on the earth. He lost his battle in heaven against Michael and his angels. You see? So what you realize is what's going to be seen in heaven is the event that will then be following what will take place in the first half of trumpets in the heavens. Which is why I don't believe that there will be alien ship type thing coming to the earth, good or bad, until the Lord is seen coming on Mount Zion, and the world is freaking out. Will they see things in the sky? I, I believe so. I think that's pretty clear by this time frame of Middish seals from, from uh, Revelation 12, 3, 4, from Revelation 6 at the time of the sixth seal to uh, um, Mark's discourse at the timing of just before the coming of the Lord and seeing those things, seeing the, the stones, uh, uh, all the meteors coming down. <clears throat> so clearly there was something that did cause that. And we're told that it happened mid seals when the great red dragon was there. So something 
and that it was the dragon that gave power and authority to the beast. So maybe that maybe the ship under under cover or whatever it's going to be would come, and that's how he gets more authority and more power from the beast for the beast from the dragon. But the actual seeing, the actual first seeing of it coming to the earth that causes the panic to the world, I believe is the Lord coming with heavenly Mount Zion. And watch how we can prove this out even more. <clears throat> watch what happens. We see this in the same, remember in what I was talking to you about with Moses, right? In the story of Exodus is the story of Moses. And when they fled, we know they fled at the time of Passover, right, of unleavened bread. And they fled and they took off into the wilderness. Well, Mark's discourse in this time of fleeing is the one that's directly associated right here. And when they were in the wilderness, they, they, they had the temple of the Lord and it was covered in skins and it was portable, right? So the temple of the Lord during seals, because it's still the time of the Gentile age, there they are fleeing the temple of the Lord, fleeing as it was in the typology of Moses. But remember, Moses isn't the only one here at this point. Remember, there's, an, there's a Moses company and there's the Elijah company. And this is a group of people in an Elijah company being prepared. But Moses' place is also represented during seals, just as the Elijah company of those being sent out are. It would appear that the Moses company are more of those who, who will facilitate and help people in the wilderness, leading them in the way. But it would appear... The, the Elijah company are those that will go out throughout the earth, reaching the people and directing them to these places with the Moses company in these places of protection throughout the earth. And what happens at the picture of the end of seals? Just like, just like John the Baptist, John the Baptist dies and Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, takes over. Well, what do we get the picture of Moses? Moses dies, right? Because of what happened in the wilderness, he ends up dying before going over into the promised land. And who's going to take over? Joshua or Yeshua, the son of Nun. And look at the timing of this, okay? From the end of Thyatira, which is a picture of numbers as well. So if we take that to the end of Thyatira in the wilderness, what do we have? We have Moses dying in the wilderness as a picture of the end of the six years of seals, which is like a picture of the John the Baptist type workers, not the Elijah ones, although some of them will have died. <coughs> because remember, Elijah was taken up in a chariot. John the Baptist died. Elijah didn't die. But Elijah was the John the Baptist. But Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind John, Moses, and John the Baptist died. Who's the other one that dies as a picture of the end of seals? It's the Moses type. And it's Joshua, the son of Nun, connected to the book of Numbers. And if we go to the book of Numbers <clears throat> and we find this connection, <coughs> excuse me, it leads us to the revelation <clears throat> that started the beginning being in Taurus. That Hosea <clears throat> of Ephraim, it was Caleb and Hosea, the son of Nun. And Moses changes Hosea's name. See, it, it's Hosea, just so you see. Hosea changes his name from Hosea, the son of Nun, to Joshua or Yeshua. Yahushua, right? Joshua. A picture of Christ at the exact same timing representing the end of Thyatira and the coming of the Lord. So what ended up happening with Moses? He dies. Joshua, Yeshua, takes over, and he's the one that what? Brings them into the promised land. So this is a picture when Moses dies and Joshua takes over. It's a picture of the end of seals, the John the Baptist, Moses types that have died, and who are those that remain that would be taken up in a whirlwind? It would, of course, be the Elijahs. <clears throat> so watch what happens. In Luke chapter 12, 
we were told when he's explaining, remember, when he was explaining over here to that first remnant group and then talked about the second group and the third group, he then goes to tell them right here. He says in verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. You see, when he comes for the 40 days, he's coming to bring division. He says, from henceforth, there shall be five in, in one house divided, three against two, two against three. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, in-law, daughter, so forth, right? Well, this is exactly <clears throat> what I was talking about earlier. It starts in the 40 days because the Lord is here bringing division. And it goes through the time of seals. Here's the first half of seals before the abomination in Mark's discourse. And look at what we see. Uh, the, the, when they shall lead you to be delivered. Uh, don't worry about what you'll say. The Holy Ghost will speak. Now, brother shall betray brother to death and father, son. Children shall rise up parents and cause their parents to be put to death. There's the division. This is the division that he said he would bring when he's coming for 40 days. It's this division that the disciples, when they go out during the time of seals, during that first half, during the, the greatest time of revival in the chaos, that is going to bring greater division. The Lord is bringing the division, and this remnant group of workers, prepared group, are going to continue this division because it's of all about coming to Christ, who is the divider, who is, you want to stay, you stay. I'm going to be with Christ. But what happens at the end of seals? What happens at the end of seals? The division in this is going to be gone. That's why when you go to Matthew's discourse, you no longer read about division between father and son, mother and daughter. It doesn't exist in Matthew's. It's only during Mark's portion, during the time of seals. But remember what happens to the Elijah John the Baptist type. They're the ones taken up in the whirlwind at the end, like the Elijah did in the past. And he was taken up in a chariot. And in a chariot, that's called an upper millstone. So when, the, when Messiah is coming at the end of the six year of seals and he's coming on this massive ship looking mountain thing, there's also going to be other ships with him. These upper millstones. Because the Elijahs are going in a chariot, which looks like an upper millstone, a ship. Proving that they're good ones and that there are bad ones. And we know that this is the good one and we'll be preparing the saints for this good one that's coming. So when we come to Malachi, understanding that division was taken during that time, and we go to Malachi chapter 4, and we see the Elijah type, who is the John the Baptist Elijah type, and there's the John the Baptist Moses type. We were just talking about the Moses type and showing that connection to seals and the temple and being the body and, and being in the wilderness. We know that it, it, the association does not appear to have a connection to, to these fallen ones being here yet. Not in the sense of them coming on their ships. Now, were there giants in those days and even after, it says, in, in Genesis chapter 6? Yes. Which means even now there are giants in the land. But these giants that are in the land are probably people that are in the world that you wouldn't know they're quote-unquote the giants and, and the, the, the fallen, right? The giants, the, the offspring of them throughout generation after generation because they just look like people now. But at mid-trumpets, that's a different story, and I'm going to show that to you. But here we are at the end of seals, again, proving this timing of quote-unquote alien ships coming. Because it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the, listen to this, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Hold on a second. The great and dreadful day of the Lord? Didn't we talk about that? Revelation chapter 6, when is the coming of the Lord? The, the what? The great day? This is the great day of the Lord. When is it? At the end of the six years of seals, at the time of the Reformation, exactly in the chapters to the churches, 
then for the collection of the saints and it starts with elijah the prophet because that company of the elijah group that survived will be taken up in chariots called upper millstones ships of the good guys so it says and i will send you elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the lord and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers you see this he's turning them they're going to turn now to each other when mid seals was just telling us that they were turned against each other but this group of people going to publish the gospel to all nations this remnant group are going to restore this group by bringing them back together before the end of seals and that's why we see in mark's gospel this is why you don't see it in luke but you see it in mark chapter 9 and when do you see it in mark chapter 9 the after six days of the transfiguration of mark the exact same timing we've been talking about and look at what it says talking about moses and elijah with them and look at what it says in verse 12 uh, verse 11 and they asked him saying why say the scribes that elijah must first come and verily uh, sorry and he answered and told them elijah verily cometh first and restores all things and how it is written of the son of man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught but i say unto you that elijah is indeed come and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed you see he did already come by the end of the sixth year and restore all things and when he restored all things what did he do he restored all things that the son messiah had brought division to so that they could wake up in this craziness and understand the season and time and the elijah company brought them back together again so that at the coming of the great day of the lord they would be ready at the great multitude rapture that's what these guys are doing these guys are the ones publishing it so look at when we come to elijah when does the elijah company remember what happens there's the wanderings right smyrna is the elijah company and there's this wanderings because they're they're wandering throughout the earth when they go out from jerusalem and so there's the wandering until this time of middish when the when the beast gets his power when is this time of pergamum when the beast gets his power <clears throat> let's go back and look at that quickly when it comes to the time of the beast getting his power and we go to pergamum we talked about this earlier this is why i brought it up this is that point of the fleeing into the wilderness and everything else because who shows up balaam and balak balaam and balak show up and what do we see who's with balaam and balak the the hidden manna okay you've got the hidden manna because they're fleeing into the wilderness so the lord is going to provide for them while they're fled into the wilderness with the hidden manna like he did for moses and those in the wilderness with the portable temple of flesh you see how crazy it is and now to thyatira because what happens with thyatira it's those that were seduced by who jezebel those that were seduced by jezebel who was the one seduced who is who took part in this stuff with jezebel right that tried to corrupt them first kings first kings chapter 17 so when the lord is coming at the end of seals we see this conversation of jezebel and jezebel is connected to the timing of elijah in first kings right all throughout first kings first kings first kings first kings second kings all about elijah <coughs> all about this timing at the late stage of elijah when elijah and the elijah company will restore the fathers and sons together okay the mothers and daughters and restore families look at what it says in the churches in the in the was at the time of the end of the wilderness the end of thyatira remember this line as we were talking about before as the lord's coming look at what it says <clears throat> at the coming of the lord the time of the reformation the end of six years right the the october 31st November 1st, collection of the saints at the end of six years. What else is going to take place? It's the period of Israel's kings when Messiah will be high priest and king, but it's also the time of what? 
First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings is the relation of Elijah. When Elijah was there with Ahab. And look at what it said. <coughs> Excuse me. There was this period of Elijah with Ahab and Jezebel. And what happened? There was a sore famine. There was a sore famine throughout the land. Well, what do we get in Revelation chapter 6? That's what I showed you early in Revelation chapter 6, that late stage where there's a famine and people are freaking out. We're seeing the exact same thing in the story of Elijah and because they're there in the midst of seals. <clears throat> and who's trying to corrupt them? Jezebel is there. So he's dealing with the story with Jezebel and Elijah. And it's a time of 1 Kings. And there was a famine throughout the land. And at the coming of the Lord, when he's going to be high priest and king, connected to the timing of the Reformation, it's First and Second Kings. And in this timing of First and Second Kings, we see the relation to Elijah with Jezebel. And we see in, in Second Kings chapter 2, we see the story of Elijah. And what do we see? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2 in our e-sword. As I truly start to wind this down. <laughs> My throat won't be able to take much more. Okay? What do we end up seeing? We see him talking, Elisha talking about a double portion. He's a representation of the 144,000 who are going to be given this greater portion because they're going to be working during the crazier time which will come in the midst of trumpets. Right at the midpoint of trumpets, which we're going to end at. <clears throat> so when Elijah is taken, he is taken in a chariot. A vehicle. An upper millstone. They see him go up in a vehicle that looks like an upper millstone. I mean, how many times have we covered this lately, right? There are good alien, quote unquote, that we've been lied to about aliens. It's the entire story of the deception that aliens are what we've been told they are when they are not that they are the good side and the bad side with the angels and i believe the timing will first be coming to the earth that will see the world freaking out will be the lord coming on heavenly mount zion and the world will think that that is the deception that's coming because that's what the world has told them it is the alien deception that's coming and because they don't know Messiah is coming at the end of seals with Mount Zion, with paradise, they're going to believe that's the deception. But who was there? Who was there to wake them up and to restore them and to bring them back together and to lead them and to teach them into the understanding of it? The Elijah company to prepare them for it. So isn't it appropriate when the Lord's coming at that point, he's also coming with ships that are going to take the Elijah company? How fitting is that? <clears throat> you think that's good? Watch what I'm about to show you now. Let's go into Psalms 68. Psalms 68. <clears throat> Let's see what's coming at the end of seals. Watch this. Uh, verse 68. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Verse 4. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah. Right? By his name, Yah. A father to the fatherless, a judge of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. <clears throat> Remember, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, right? Um, but uh, uh, let's go verse 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those that are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. Remember we were talking about the wilderness, this, this Moses connection to the wilderness, this period of time when he led them in the wilderness. So we're, we're understanding this is after that in the typology, in the prophetic. He's leading them through, and it's after that. 
He's coming riding on the heavens. Look at this. The heavens, uh, sorry, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Can you say Revelation 6, the end of it? The end of the sixth seal? The timing of the sixth seal? Even Sinai itself moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Verse 10, thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hath prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Listen to this. The Lord gave the word. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. The Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. You want to see that connection, brothers and sisters? The word, the Lord gave the word to a great company who were sent out to publish it. <clears throat> Here we are in Mark 13. Seals are going. Mark 10, uh, sorry, Mark 13, verse 10. In the early portion of seals, and the gospel must be published among all nations. You know what happens when you go to Matthews? Check it out. Matthew 24, it's not published. The words mean the same, but there's a purpose. There's a meaning to it being two different words being used, just like we were talking about earlier. Look at what Matthew says. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? In Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. What is this one? This is your 144,000 Philadelphia being sent out and will be there till the end of the Laodicean age. <clears throat> These guys, this is what I was saying. This is that second group which will be given more power like the Elijah, a double portion, because they're going to be dealing with the enemy craft people coming. But you see, this one is preached. The one in Mark was the one that said published. So there was a company, a, a great group of people that the Lord gave the word to that company who published it. You see what I'm saying? Oh, it gets better. Listen to this. Verse 15. The hill of God. It's still the mountain of God, just so you know. Okay? The mountain. Same word, 2022. The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, a high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, you high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. You ready for this? The chariots, the vehicles, the upper millstones, the alien-looking ships, as we've been told, the chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Hello. When is he coming with his 20,000 chariots? At a time when the publishing has been done. When this coming of these chariots with the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain, he's got upper millstone vehicles coming with him at a time when Elijah himself is one being taken up in one of those upper millstones. <clears throat> I told you, <laughs> the tribulation is way crazier wild than anybody can imagine and is why anybody who tries to tell you the tribulation has begun stop watching them don't even bother trying to decipher something they might say in it it's not worth your time the tribulation has not begun oh can you say yes in the big picture of 21 yes but not the official tribulation as people have come to understand tribulation. Absolutely not. 
So now, now that the Lord has come, he has come on Mount Zion. The world saw this, this massive looking mountain ship. <clears throat> I believe that's the first real encounter that will happen. And then the portion that is getting confused with what, um, with what uh, Eli Marzuli was saying. This is the timing. He thinks it's related to up here, though he doesn't talk about it up here because he doesn't understand the timing. <clears throat> he thinks that this is what causes the one world religion and new world order and all that. It's not. Because I don't believe it's going to happen here. Something will be seen, sure, but not this event of these things coming to the earth yet. It's not until the Son of Man is coming. And we know that other ships, because the Elijahs are taken up. The great multitude is going to paradise. Are these ships going to take them there to the great mountain? I mean, it's going to be pretty wild looking. 20,000 of his own ships, how big are they going to be? And that's the good side. That's the Lord's. But now listen to what happens next. Here we are. The end of the six year of seals. <clears throat> and then you've got the 1260 days coming. What's going to happen during the 1260 days? This is why I was telling you, I don't believe that they're coming to the earth, the bad guy ones, until the second half of the trumpet judgments, which is the time when Messiah is cut off. Because these guys are so bad and so wicked and so evil, I don't see how the stuff of seals could have gone through and taken place if they were already on the earth at that time. <clears throat> and we've got scripture. As we said, that verse 3 tells us this wonder is in heaven. And when we come to verse 7, we see in Revelation 12, verse 7, and there was a war in heaven, in heaven again. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. These are going to be ships versus ships, guys. Like groups of ships and, and whatever, however they, you know what I mean? This is what I'm telling you. The deception is that we've been told aliens are these other things when really it's not just the fallen. That's only half the story. There's the good side of them too. And what's going to happen? This is going to be a war in heaven that's going to be lasting for three and a half years approximately. With Michael and his angels against Satan and his? What are they going to be battling in? What kind of battle could there possibly be that suddenly... Satan and his angels are cast down to the earth. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm punching you? Are they, are, they, are they spiritual swords clinging in the sky? They're angels with wings flapping everywhere, yet they're spiritual beings so nobody can die, nobody can be cast. Like, how do they get cast to the earth? You see, when you start asking these, these questions and you're like, uh, yeah, wait a second. You see? So when, he, when this battle takes place, we know it's the first half of trumpet judgments while this is taking place in heaven. So might it be seen at night or, you know, far off and things zipping around up there at night? Maybe they'll be able to see it. But for the first three and a half years of trumpets, we know the Lord is there on Mount Zion. So it's this, this wildness has already been made visual and is already on the earth with the Lord. While this craziness is going to be taking place up in the heavens, up in the space. Until he loses at mid trumpets at the ten and a half year mark, the point when Messiah gets cut off. When they when Revelation 12, 14 says they fly away on the wings of an eagle for the last three and a half years, time and times and half a time, one plus two plus a half, three and a half years. But when do they flee? <clears throat> it says when the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast unto the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Uh-oh, this is psycho crazy time. This is the point of now Matthew's discourse. This is the point of Matthew's discourse at the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Because now the temple will have been rebuilt, as you know, at mid-trumpets. And now him being cast down. The pit is going to be opened. What? This is why I said, when these guys are cast down and that power and authority, the pit is going to be open and all hell, that's where the term comes from, that's when all hell will break loose. And that's why it's 
Woe unto them that are with child. It's going to be worse. Look at this. Uh, then shall be great tribulation, tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. It's going to last for the final two and a half years of the last three and a half years. It'll last for two and a half years. From 10 and a half years into the 14 to the end of 13 years. This is the chaos that's coming when the serpent is cast down. So this ship battle in heaven and what people think this equals sometime in seals isn't really in seals. It's at mid trumpets when Messiah gets cut off. And what happens at this point, as many of you guys know from the teachings over the years, is in Revelation chapter 17, <coughs> we know that the beast who was here, right? We see that the beast that was, that's when he was here for 42 months, and then is not because he's destroyed at the end of seals, he's cast into hell. And we know that the false prophet doesn't get put into hell, but the beast does and the, and the armies and stuff that fought with him. And it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Which means when Satan is cast down and his angels with him, the pit is going to be opened. It tells us right here. The pit is going to be opened. We see it in uh, Revelation 9. <clears throat> when the fifth angel sounds at the first woe, a star falls and is given the key to the bottomless pit. And when he opens the bottomless pit, we know who's coming out. The one who was, is not, and then shall be. And who is it? It's the beast. So at mid trumpets, when the pit is opened, when hell is opened, and all of this is coming out, and the fallen angels are there because they've lost their battles and they've come down on their ships. You see? It's not just a great deception of thinking the ships are only the bad guys. It's certainly not no Project Bluebeam. There are good and there are bad. And this is the point with unequivocal certainty. This is the point when the bad guys will be here, though there might be glimpses throughout seals. This is the point when they get here and it is chaos bad. It is so bad that they're going to be eating people. You see this? We see it right here. Revelation eleven seven, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them. This war is going to last two and a half years. He's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. When he ascends out of the bottomless pit, we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that it's the time of the falling away. Because it's the time of what? Messiah. The, the, the removal of Israel's kings. And the 144,000 being given greater power to go out and to withstand the the enemy and the serpents and all this stuff in the second half of trumpets like the elisha receiving the second the double portion in the laodicean age is now this apostasy at the end of the 14 years the final two and a half of those years when he's now the son of perdition at the time of laodicea the last two and a half of the three and a half years and the son of perdition comes He's now going to go into the temple of God that was finished by the modern day Zerubbabel, though he was, who was the overseer and one of the kings ruling with the high priest, Messiah and king. And we now see that it's the time of Israel's kings being cut off. Why are they being cut off? Because that company of ships that were in a battle with Michael and his angels in the heaven are now having lost and being cast down to the earth. The pit is going to be opened. All hell is going to break loose. <laughs> and when we go to Zechariah 11, hello, 10 and a half years in, just like we were saying, there's the beginning of the building of the temple, three and a half years, 10 and a half years in, in chapter 11, we see the vintage of old has come down. He's lost his battle. That's why he's been cast down. And now what happens? This is where Messiah, look at what it says in, Revel uh, in Zechariah 11, 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people. The Lord makes this covenant at the end of seals, very beginning of trumpets. And he has to, you know, 
there's a better way of saying it, and I, I can't remember how to say it. Uh, another pastor had mentioned it, <clears throat> and it was a great way to say it. But it's, it, it's Messiah, it's Messiah can't break his covenant, right? But it must be broken because of what the people have done. You see, and with the enemy being cast down and the pit opening, he's now taking all those that are his and he's taking them on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness where they're protected until the very end of the 14 years. And he deals in a war against these guys for the two and a half years. And we see that the beast coming back out of the pit is now going to proclaim himself God in the temple that was now finished. This is this deception because they'll now be able to say, look, we've come down from above. It was us the whole time. This other guy who is Messiah and those with him, this guy was the imposter. How, do you, how can we prove it to you? Because we defeated him. You see, we're the ones chasing him out. We're the ones that caused them to, to go fleeing away. They are the imposter. And this at mid trumpets is where they claim that they're the ones who created all of this. They're the ones. This is where L.A. Marzulli is saying they will say they did this and did that. And the world who has taken the mark and the world who is left that is not flying away on the wings of an eagle, they are left for this time of chaos. Listen to what it says in, in Zechariah 11, 9. Then said I, I will not feed you. That that die, that dieth, let it die. And that that be cut off, let it be cut off. Let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is what's coming. We don't understand what it means in Matthew that it'll be worse than ever in history, worse than mid-seals to marks. This will be the worst ever, and then we'll never be this bad again. But it's going to last for two and a half years. But those who were Christ, the saints and everybody, the pre-trib group is gone. Those that worked for the Lord, the Elijah company, the Moses company, they're gone. The great multitude rapture has happened. Those that were in Jerusalem in the rebuilding, they've flown away now on the wings of an eagle to a place protected. So virtually everyone that's left is going to be the enemies, but not all. Because remember, the 144,000 are still the ones going out during that time. Could you imagine being one of them at that point? And they will be saving some. They will still be saving some because not everybody will turn to, to Satan and the beast and all of them. Not everybody will still have taken the mark. But we know a great number of them will be rejoicing at the end of the two years when the two witnesses are killed before they stand back up again, taken to heaven, and then the Lord returns to begin the 14th year feet down on the Mount of Olives. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I told you it was going to be a trip, right? So actually, let me finish with this part because we're talking about the trumpets portion. Remember the the seals time is done and it's the Mos it's the Elijah comp uh, sorry the Moses portion is done at the end of seals and it's Joshua the son of Nun Messiah right Yeshua Joshua who's now the one who takes them over that's why it's a picture of Christ at the end of the six year of seals and he's the one as the booties at that time with the All Saints Day that is coming to take them over into the promised land we saw that. If you remember, even in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 with, with uh, Abraham, we see the pre-trib group Enoch. We see the 40 days of the Noah group. And then we see the Lord coming in the picture of Abraham, the great multitude, the, the, as the number of the sea, looking for a place that has foundations because during the midst of seals, the foundation is going to be laid. You see? And it's... Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. Or is it an inheritance because he obeyed? It's this group that is going to paradise. This group that was promised this inheritance, this place of paradise. And then we see, of course, Sarah represents the Lord coming as the, uh, as the Isaac when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's in, John, in uh, uh, um, Genesis chapter 21. 
Abraham was 86 years old, then 99, and then 100. You see, 13 years, then one, the final 14th year, and boom, Isaac is born. And it just so happens to be in chapter 21. It's the exact picture of the Lord returning. But all of them from, from uh, uh, Enoch pre-trib, then the 40 days of the Son of Man, then the coming at the end of seals, then the coming at the end of trumpets. It's the picture of all of them. And they're going to this place of promise, this place of paradise. And what we see here is this picture of Messiah as the Joshua Yeshua uh, um, son of Nun, who is going to be the one now taking them over into the promised land. You see, the place of inheritance. It's Jesus who's going to do it because the Moses type is dead. Well, if if the Moses type is a picture in uh, Numbers and uh, Deuteronomy uh, going into an, an Exodus, right? So when we see the story from the Exodus and the Numbers and Deuteronomy, at the end of Deuteronomy is when Moses dies, right? Here it is, Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy. You come to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, it's the son of Nun, which is Yeshua, the son of Nun, who takes them over into the promised land, a picture of the Lord coming at the end of seals. And then what do we see if we go to about halfway through the story of Joshua? The story of Joshua halfway through would be a picture of what? About the time of mid-trumpets. And what happens at the time of mid-trumpets? Satan is cast down. The pit is open. You could say it's like the time of the giants, right? Right? The time of the giants, the, the fallen angels, the Nephilim. Well, if we go to Joshua chapter 3, and they're going into the promised land, the place of inheritance, and what do they see? Giants. The giants are in the land. And they're going to go fight against the giants. It's an exact picture. It's, it's this picture in Revelation chapter 12. It's the Moses picture going into the Joshua picture. And the, and the prophetic is when Satan is cast down, having lost his battle against Michael and his angels. And it's the mid-trumpets, the first woe, when Satan is cast down and his angels and the pit is opened. And they're going to be eating the flesh. All hell will break loose when those ships come down that is what the world is really trying to talk about in the alien deception in the great deception that's what's happening but what they failed to recognize is that the lord comes first on heavenly mount zion the place prepared to receive those that he said he would go and prepare a place for them and return to receive them unto himself. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 12 lays it all out of those like a rapture who are going to the third heaven and the such an one was caught up of those going to paradise, which is Mount Zion coming at the end of the sixth seal and the Lord receiving them unto himself. Brothers and sisters, it is a wild, wild, wild ride through prophecy, through scripture. It, and it all goes back to the foundation that began it all. It is the revelation of who the gospel speak to first that reveal the timing of the end of days. And if you find anybody else that can show you this and this revelation, please send them my way. Send me their info. Lead them. Uh, give me their info so I could reach out because together this we would explode it even more. But I haven't found any. And according to ancient writings, there was somebody being prepared for this. And this company in this group is mentioned with booties. At the same time of booties, when Messiah is mentioned in booties. It's wild, guys. It is so crazy. 
I shake my head. I, I, I don't eat this. You understand why I say the thousand pound weight at the beginning that I just feel it on my mind because I'm trying to comprehend the, the, the everything of this. And it's too much. It is too much to comprehend. It's too much to wrap your head around and really dig in. Because if you spend your, too much time, which I've been doing lately, and that's what causes me more, more weight. But when you spend too much time pondering how close we are, that we're a couple weeks away, right? Or one, two, okay, three weeks away. And, and what it's really going to mean. And are we really prepared? What more can we do, Lord? Can you show us something so that we can really understand this is the time? What about all of our loved ones? What about the people that we're praying for and all these people around the world? How on earth can we possibly handle being in this time? And Lord, what if it's not this time? What if we've misunderstood by one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years? <laughs> I know your feelings, guys. I know your thoughts. You're not alone. As, as, the, as a teacher, in, in putting this all out, you could imagine... You can imagine the same thoughts that you're having and, and beyond. But the Lord will not give us more than we can handle. He has prepared his people. And when the time comes, the understanding, the power, the authority, the anointing of the Holy Ghost will all be made known and given to them. So we have no fear. Let us just keep watching, praying, diligently seeking. And praying for all of our loved ones and those we're trying to reach. We don't have to annoy them. But maybe give them another little reminder if you haven't lately. If you have, don't worry about it. But another little reminder to say, hey, be watchful. I believe the time is very, very, very close. And I'll tell you this. If we see Israel attack the, the, the nuclear plant, maybe some of their, their oil refineries, something huge, one of like something really huge like that then hold on hold on because we are at the door even though it already looks like it we could say it now if we see israel attack something major iran's coming but the attack from iran those going pre-trib will not see the attack from iran dropping maybe tactical nukes on haifa and tel aviv not completely destroying all of Haifa and Tel Aviv, but very badly destroying it in the sense that probably hundreds of thousands will be dead. That's what I mean by the attack that comes on Haifa and Tel Aviv, but it comes shortly after, moments, hours after the pre-trib bride of Christ. So with that, brothers and sisters, this was big. There was a lot to take in. I told you it was going to be exciting and powerful and just mind-blowing to these connections of time take your time watch it again watch it in parts and pieces and i pray it blesses you and strengthens you until i love you god bless you god bless your families we'll talk to you soon bye for now